How resilient are cities? Dealing with compounding crises. A global pandemic, growing inequality, and the climate emergency. Giving up isn't an option. Cities bring the solutions, turning the what ifs into what's possible. Producing more renewable energy than they use. Vulnerable communities having fair input into their development. Clean air for all, no empty promises. Cities are full of doers. Communities of change makers, the go-getters, trendsetters, and future thinkers. Real change is with us, with you. So what will it take? Put simply, prioritizing people and the planet. There is no more room for empty commitments. It's time to turn targets into reality. Sure, progress has been made, but there is still a long way to go. Temperatures are still rising. Seas are still rising, but people are rising too. And we are standing with them. Now is the time to harness the power and potential of our cities. Let's build on the momentum and stay united in action. Ceremonies for the C40 World Mayors Summit is Vanessa Hauk, an Emmy Award winning journalist and anchor at Noticias Telemundo. Her passion for environmental issues inspired her to create Alerta Verde, a segment on Noticias Telemundo dedicated to educating the community on the importance of protecting the planet. Today, she is the director of the Investigative Unit on Environmental Issues at Telemundo Network's Planeta Tierra. She was named one of the 10 Latinos leading on climate by HuffPost, one of the 50 most influential people on sustainability by People magazine, and received the Environmental Voice Arts Award on behalf of the Society of Voice Arts and Sciences. Please welcome to the stage Vanessa Hauk. Good morning, everybody, and welcome, welcome to C40. All of you, and to be your masters of ceremonies for the eighth C40 World's Mayor Summit. What an amazing crowd. It is my pleasure to welcome you all here to the beautiful city of Buenos Aires, una ciudad vibrante y llena de vida. A city that has been a global climate leader in Latin America a city with an ambitious hydraulic plant that greatly mitigated the risk of flooding, where residents can access a recycling point just 150 meters away from home, and where street lighting is 100% LED, saving 44,000 tons of CO2 per year, and where 600,000 cyclists regularly use the city's eco-buy system. The city of Buenos Aires is a long-standing member of C40. C40 represents nearly 600 million people and one-fifth of the global economy. And C40 cities are at the forefront of climate action, deploying science-based and collaborative approach to help the world limit global heating to 1.5 Celsius and build healthy, equitable and resilient communities. In the defining decade for humanity, C40 mayors are not here to talk about mid-century targets. They are urgently working together to halve emissions by 2030, creating fair societies that protect millions of peoples from the impacts of climate breakdown. The proof is in the numbers. Three quarters of C40 cities are outperforming the respective nation states in emission reductions. Air pollutions have been cut 5% across C40 cities in the past year alone. And mayors are driving public-private partnerships that finance projects to make immediate progress, reducing emissions and improving resilience in climate impacts. 
The summit in Buenos Aires will bring together the largest ever gathering of mayors from the world's leading cities, including including more Global South mayors than ever, and their first global gathering since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. C40 mayors are united in action to lead the transition away from pollution-based economies to a people-centered future by creating cleaner, greener, and fairer cities. Over the next two days, you will hear from global mayors and leading voices in finance, environmental justice, climate science and business. C40 World's Mayor Summit aims to showcase the transformative actions cities are already delivering and accelerate the bold climate solutions needed to deliver the significant emission reductions that will kill 1.5 alive and create more resilient, prosperous and equitable future. I'd like to thank a special thank you to all those partners whose support in the past months have been essential to delivering this summit. We are just so excited to have you on board. Thank you so much. Finally, we want to continue the conversation online. So please add the hashtag United in Action and the hashtag C40 Summit to all your posts on social media. And thanks to everyone from around the world tuning in to the live stream. We love to hear from you on what policy will bring the most well-being to your city. Go to c40.org slash united in action to share your ideas, which could end up here on the summit main stage. And now let's begin the summit. It is an honor for me to introduce the first speaker today, our host, the head of government of the city of Buenos Aires, Mr. Horacio Rodriguez Larreta. Mr. Larreta has a degree in economics from the University of Buenos Aires and has a master's in business administration from Harvard University, so the head of government of the Autonomous City of Buenos Aires in 2015. In 2019, he was re-elected to the same position with 55.9% of votes. He was the first head of government selected uh, in the City of Buenos Aires. Internationally speaking, in 2018, the head of government created Urban 20 together uh, with, the, uh, with the French mayor, Anne Hidalgo, wonderful mayor, a forum that unites the most important cities of this G20 countries to debate and to create new commitments in, in terms of action, climate action, and well-being of all people. Thank you so much for welcoming us in your city, uh, Mr. Horacio Rodriguez Larreta. Please, let's welcome the head of government of the city of Buenos Aires. Thank you so much. Bienvenido, muchas gracias. Welcome and thank you so much. Well, welcome everybody. Good morning. We are <laughs> welcome to the city of Buenos Aires. We are so honored to be hosting now this important meeting the C40 World Mayor Summit. It is both, it is very humbling, very exciting for us, for me, to be here with this uh, prestigious audience. We, as she said before, we are almost doubling the participants of the last summit, summit doubling. That means that our shared agenda is, uh, is engaging more and more people all around the world. Every day, there are thousands of global citizens that join the commitment that we are facing what is one of the biggest challenges of our times, which is climate change. And this is partly the result of our collaborative action this is why I would like to begin our journey through this uh, summit these days by thanking all of you to be attending this meeting. Thank you very much.
thanks to the more than 100 mayors that are here in our beautiful country, coming from all over the world. And there are many others that are now following this agenda virtually. So welcome to <laughs> and a special mention to our friend, to Sadiq Khan. <clears throat> Sadiq is the president of C40, and he has been, he has gave us a continuous support, encouragement, and you trust in Buenos Aires to be the hosting city. Thank you, Sadiq. Also, I would like to give a warm welcome to the former C40 president, Mr. Eric Garcetti from Los Angeles. <laughs> and Mayor Anne Hidalgo from Paris. Dear Anne, Dear Anne, I am very happy to be meeting you here to be working together uh, once again on this common challenge. I remember very clearly having met here in Buenos Aires in 2016 and in Paris in 2017. You have always spoken to me with great enthusiasm about Parisian projects to transform your city into a 15-minute city, which we have done the same. We've done the same here in Buenos Aires. To my colleague, Claudia Lopez Hernandez, mayor of Bogotá. We share the vice presidency of C40 for Latin America, and we are having a strong alliance to tackle this challenge in our region. So thank you also, Claudia. Thanks also to the, all the C40 Executive Com uh, Committee, and a special thank you to the more than 150 Argentine cities that have come to the summit and we've been working all around the year. So thank you very much, there are many here. <clears throat> thanks to all the volunteers, thanks to all the attendees for your commitment. And also, I hope that, that uh, besides working, you will enjoy your stay in Buenos Aires. Please take some time off so you can, yes, Sadiq, don't make us work so much. <laughs> so, so we all have some time to enjoy the city, to visit destinations in Buenos Aires and all around the country. We make a great effort to have a beautiful city for all our visitors. Well, now, if you allow me, I will continue this uh, open remarks in Spanish. Thank you. Para mí. To me, to us all, this summit is very important, not just because of the subject that convene, uh, convenes us, which is, of course, transcendental for the whole of the humanity, but also because this summit reflects three values in which I believe firmly, I firmly believe in them. First, the value of cooperation, working together, the value of dialogue, the value of consensus, so we should be aware of this. We have 121 cities in the whole world who are working together in a common agenda. This is not very common. Cities of, from different countries, from different origins and sources, with different socioeconomic realities, and even with different uh, political ideologies, even with such differences. We are working together. We are convinced that we always think about and prioritize the well-being of the millions of people we represent. And I am so proud to see that this spirit, which is common and traditional in C40, is starting to be experienced here in our country, in Argentina. 
Our country has been for decades and centuries been divided. But thanks to this summit, throughout this year, we had 150 mayors or nationwide, and I'm talking about large, medium, and small-sized uh, places of different political colors. We worked together. We thought about climate change agenda as a priority, and we consensed and we agreed on a joint declaration establishing an action plan for climate action. This is a great achievement, an achievement that I am so hopeful because it shows that there is a different path here in Argentina. We can talk, there is dialogue, we can work together. It is a new Argentina, the Argentina of getting together, working united, looking to <clears throat> make progress, looking to build a long-term vision. And here is where the second value that I really, really value from this summit, and it really moves me, which is that um, that, cha that that fight for long-lasting change. Change is true if it is sustained throughout generations. Otherwise, it is just anecdotal in the story and history of a country. And clearly, the fight to combat climate change requires that long-term vision. If we don't achieve a sustainable impact, humanity, the whole humanity, will be at risk. And it's not that I want to be an alarmist. Rather, I want to share the responsibility we have in this summit, and even more so in the actions we must carry out from the summit on. We know that climate action, whatever we do, will take time. Now, of course, we need courage to work for a long-lasting change. The actions that we establish will not have an impact tomorrow morning or overnight. And even it is likely that when the outcomes of this work and path are seen, we will no longer be here. We will not be in our positions, nor taking any public servant positions. I don't even know if we will be in this world. This is the courage we need. It is the grandeur of acting, thinking long term. It is what our people, our people expect from us. Climate action goes beyond our roles, of our positions. We should do it as human beings. That is the responsibility, thinking about the future, thinking about our children's grandchildren and maybe great-grandchildren's children. Now, the dialogue, that consensus for that long-lasting change must have a starting point that is very, very important indeed and compelling, that is to speak with the truth. That is a third value of this summit which is so necessary today in Argentina. What is not spelled out is not recognized. And what you do not recognize is not resolved. Today, climate change, it is an unparalleled scientific fact. And as unparalleled, is those who generate the climate change are us, human beings. That is why, if we take this value of the truth, I wanted at the very beginning of this summit to put on the table three uh, great preconceptions that are now in the climate agenda. The first is to think that someone can be free from the consequences of climate change. It is true that it does impact, in a disproportionate fashion, the poorest countries, those that have less resources, those that don't have the necessary infrastructure. Now, beyond that, today, the impact is worldwide. This year in Europe, they had the most severe drought in over a millennium. 
And in some areas of North America, it was the worst drought historically. Developed countries. In Asia, there are 40 million people who had to leave their homes, their jobs, and had to be displaced because of floods. In our country, in Argentina, there's drought, floods. There are also wildfires. They change, they damage the quality of life of so many fellow citizens impacting on the agricultural and uh, farming production, the economy affecting biodiversity as well. Obviously, facing this uh, task requires everybody's devotion, but not all of us are doing the same work. Cities are the best example of this. We are the ones who mostly emit, but also we are the ones who have most, uh, they're mostly responsible for acting. That doesn't mean that the rest cannot contribute. And this leads to my second preconception, which is the one that says that only developed countries can actually contribute in the fight against climate change. That is not true. In our city here in Buenos Aires, for over 15 years, We've thought about environmental care as a priority. And here, prior to me, in this scenario with all the achievements that were, that, that we achieved, but we're not alone. There are many Latin American countries, like working with Claudia, working with the same commitment in mitigation, many participating in this summit, which confirms such commitment. Beyond the fact that we all make our efforts, the investment in the fight against climate change is focused in the countries in the North. In 2020, 75% of funding was split between Asia and North America, whereas the rest of the planet we, we focus more than half of the world population, we received 25%. Although this principle of common responsibilities, but different, forces the Northern Hemisphere to take on a greater responsibility, I wanted to be clear that Latin America has the potential to be a key region in the fight against climate change, and we are committed. And the third preconception, which is so uh, established, is this false contradiction between environmental care and economic development, as if they were incompatible. And it is not so, and even less so if you have a vision that is mid and long term. I mean, the action against climate change is an opportunity for development. It is not incompatible. And we see it in our country. We are one of the most efficient protein producers worldwide. And there are many Argentine companies with high technology that show that we could provide and be reliable in terms of food provision, but following the criteria of sustainable production, creating a lot of jobs and what we call green jobs today. You can do it. We can do it. We have uh, Satellogic Pachama water plan that are state-of-the-art companies that tap into technology and knowledge to improve farming and food production, caring for the environment. And today, this also creates an added issue when we sell those products. The other example is with renewable energies where we prioritized in the previous uh, administration renewable um, you know, energy that create uh, jobs in all the world. We have Henea that has the largest solar and wind energy plant in the south in Puerto, Puerto Madryn. We also have in the north Cauchari in Jujuy, which is the solar energy park, which is the largest in Latin America. And as we move forward in the transition towards renewable economies, we can also develop and transition energies that are less contaminating. As you see, 
there is a lot, a lot of work to be done. And the way to do it is to cooperate, working as a team, talking with the truth, and working together to, to reach a long-lasting change that will remain for throughout generation. It is the only path, and we will achieve it. We will accomplish it if we join forces, if we work together from north to south, east to west. We work to reach climate justice. We work to resolve the greatest global challenge faced by the world. And this summit has a decisive role in doing so. Working together, we have to move forward towards a green recovery, fighting against recession together with sustainability, reaching then economic development in more just and equitable societies. I am sure that we will achieve it. So let's get to it. So let's get to it. Welcome to Buenos Aires, and let's enjoy this meeting. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Rodriguez Larreta, for your hospitality and for sharing these remarks and for welcoming us here in the beautiful city of Buenos Aires. I'm going to give you an overview of how C40 cities are implementing the urgent and transformative action the world needs to limit heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius and build a healthy, equitable and resilient communities. Please join me in welcoming the Executive Director of C40, Mr. Marx Wax, to the stage. Great. Bienvenido, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa, and good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful uh, to see everyone back together again at a C40 summit. And uh, thank you, Mayor Loretta, for a really inspiring start today, and indeed to you and your whole team for welcoming us to your beautiful city and being such great partners. Uh, I'd also like to thank Anthony Williams and the whole Bloomberg team for a really uplifting award ceremony last night. Indeed. I'm afraid there's not going to be any tango for the next 10 minutes. Instead, instead, I can offer you lots of numbers uh, and some good news. So what you're going to see on the screen behind me now is the evidence that the high impact actions that we monitor C40 cities delivering, the things that we really need to do to halve emissions by 2030, like bringing in a low emission zone or getting universal waste collection, those high impact actions have been tripled in their delivery in the last 10 years. And perhaps Equally important in the current economic context, we can see that green C40 cities are creating more jobs and less pollution. C40 research that we've published to coincide with this summit indeed shows that investing in solar-powered buildings can generate six times as many jobs as the same investment in gas-powered electricity. And the same is true in many other sectors. Indeed, uh, Mel Balmonte has shown us uh, the jobs that she has created converting idle land into urban farms in Quezon City, bringing healthy food on the table uh, for families when COVID lockdowns had affected food supplies. And you'll, you'll see there's a number 1,400 jobs on the screen there. But Mayor Balmonte tells me that's now 15,000 jobs, which I guess is the kind of inflation we like. 
And we see right across C40 cities uh, that mayors are ensuring that the least well-off benefit the most from climate action. Like in Jakarta, which has doubled its public transport coverage in the last four years alone, and done it whilst reducing the cost of travelling from 30% of average income spent on public transport to 10%. And we can see more generally that C40 cities are showing that the best way to protect people everywhere from rising prices and extreme weather is to invest in green cities. In Barcelona, households in energy poverty save 225 euros a year thanks to Mayor Calao investing in a publicly owned city energy company that provides insulation and home resilience for those who need it most. And globally, we know that the wealthiest 10% of us contribute half of global carbon emissions. So to tackle the climate emergency, we have to ensure that the polluter pays and that public investment benefits the majority. Like in Stockholm, where households on high incomes pay three times as much than those on low incomes, under the city's road pricing scheme, and that has reduced car traffic on the roads by 20% whilst funding public transport, cycling and walking, which benefits everybody. And we can see that C40 cities are delivering major health benefits, like Beijing, which has halved air pollution in just the last eight years, or in London, where Mayor Khan is very much leading from the front with the toughest vehicle emission standards in the world in an ultra-low emission zone that benefits 3.8 million London residents. But, and there, there's always a but, while C40 cities are making faster progress than most, it's not yet enough. So that the impact of that trebling of delivery of high impact actions that I showed you in that first slide has had a big effect. It's greatly uh, reduced emissions in C40 City compared to what would have been business as usual, as you can see on the graph. However, that second shaded bit shows that we're not yet quite on track to halve emissions by 2030, about 9% behind at the moment. And what we need to do to get back on track is to treble the pace of delivery of those high impact actions again, but this time just in the next eight years. So these are some of the areas where looking at the data, we can see that we need to deliver bigger and faster. There are 13 cities across C40 at the moment that are currently delivering zero emission building regulation. That number needs to double to 26 in the next two years. Like Joburg, with its first in Africa green building policy. There are 18 cities that currently only procure zero emission buses. That number needs to grow to 39 by 2024, following the example of Mayor Garcetti in Los Angeles, Shenzhen, many of our other Chinese cities. There are 29 cities that currently offer fully segregated waste collection across their cities. That needs to grow to 52 in the next two years, like our host city here, Buenos Aires, where Mayor Loretta has ensured that all across the city, people can now separate out their recycling. And I'm, I'm very glad that tomorrow there's going to be an announcement by a group of Global South cities here uh, saying how they will accelerate towards zero waste in their cities. So I've talked a lot here about sharing best practice. One of the things we really need to see is, is today's really most innovative practices becoming mainstream. We've all been watching how Mayor Hidalgo stood up to organized opposition from the car lobby, uh, removed a four-lane highway from the center of Paris, giving it back to pedestrians and cyclists, and then sparking a global movement towards 15-minute cities or how Mayor Johansson has introduced a rule in his city, in Oslo, that the city can only pass the annual financial budget if it can be demonstrated that it will deliver the annual carbon reduction targets. And now 12 cities from London to Schwani, New York to Mumbai have joined the C40 climate budget program to find their own way of doing that. And I hope every city will join that program very soon. 
So I've talked mostly here about cutting emissions, but one thing we can really see now that climate impacts are ramping up is that unless we improve resilience, we'll lose the capacity to cut the emissions. So David King, who's going to address us very shortly, I'm sure is going to tell us that we're already breaching some of the most critical climate tipping points, like the rate at which the Arctic ice is melting and breaching them far sooner than anyone predicted. So our cities have got to become more resilient. Like in Phoenix, where Mayor Gallego has transformed 112 kilometers of walkways into cool pavements. Or like how Mayor Aki Sawyer is creating jobs and hope in Freetown, regrowing forests and mangroves that were destroyed by civil war. And as that extreme weather starts to ramp up all around the world, we're seeing more and more people displaced from their homes. And when they flee, they mostly flee to the nearest big city. Like how uh, Mayor Islam in Dhaka North welcomes 2,000 climate migrants every day, mostly fleeing from climate impacts elsewhere in Bangladesh, which is why Mayor Islam is leading C40's work with the Mayor's Migration Council to put the role of cities on climate migration on global agendas. Now, across all of this, of course, we need to raise more money. We need more finance for all of this action. But I really see how strong city policy and regulation is unlocking billions of dollars of more finance for climate action. Like the C40 uh, zero emission bus program in Latin America, where we've uh, used strong policy in cities like Bogota and Santiago, that's enabled us then to bring together bus manufacturers and financiers, and just so far created a billion dollars more of private finance for uh, zero emission buses in Latin American cities. Or in New York, where really tough mandatory limits on emissions and large buildings, backed by really quite significant fines for landlords, uh, has now creating an estimated $20 billion market in renovating skyscrapers. And again, tomorrow, there's going to be uh, an announcement of a number of new partnerships bringing hundreds of millions of dollars more uh, of finance, particularly for our global south cities. So overall, I hope it is clear from that quick run through that C40 cities really are able to move faster towards cleaner, fairer, healthier cities, as Mayor Loretta said, because we're collaborating so well together. But let's not also forget that data which shows that we all need to do more and we need to do it faster. I'm really confident that we will do that as the strap line of this summit says, because C40 cities are united in action. And indeed, indeed, talking of unity, uh, it's now my honor to introduce our first guest speaker. She is a, a climate and environmental rights activist from Kampala, Uganda. She's the founder of Uganda's Fridays for Future movement. She's been a really key ally uh, in bringing together city and youth climate leaders, including in C40's Mayors and Youth Forum. Please give a huge reception to Hilda Flavia Nakabui. There is Hilda. Thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, before you is a black girl from a poor country, one that's most hit by the climate crisis, from a race that has, very, that has done very little to contribute to the climate crisis but is suffering its effects. Before you is a witness and a direct victim of a crisis that was created by the global north. One that was orchestrated by the fossil fuel industry to reap profits while the dreams of African children are shattered. I come from a generation that chose to end climate injustice and took on a challenge to fight for the planet, to fight for future generations and everyone present here today. I am the voice of the dying children, displaced women, 
and people suffering at the hands of the climate crisis created by rich countries. I am Hilda Flavia Nakawye, a founder of Uganda's Fridays for Future Movement, a youth organization fighting for climate justice. I and my generation have a debt to pay because someone in the global north grew richer by burning fossil fuels. The global north developed and continues to develop at the expense of nature and human life. I am not here to charge you, but to inform you that you left the responsibility of cleaning your mess to girls like me and my generation. For how long? <laughs> For how long will you continue burning fossil fuels? For how long will you continue burning our only planet? For how long will you continue destroying our future? For how long will it take you to switch from fossil fuels to clean energy? How much time do you need to make more money from oil? Your greed for abnormal profits is a threat to our survival, to our generation. Meetings on cities are increasing, but the quality of cities are deteriorating. I come from Kampala city, a city that has increasingly become a nightmare for its residents and visitors alike. Garbage and potholes have defined the city's slummy status for the last three decades. We are exposed to multiple hazards, including floods, fires, and landslides. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, I'm not only here to speak, but to promote climate action. As an advocate of climate action and a girl who spends most of my time finding solutions to climate crisis impacts, I would like to see mayors and other leaders committing themselves to saving the only planet we call home. I wish to remind you that the policies and decisions you make today will indelibly affect the future and my generations to come. As you seek to ensure the prosperity of our cities, it is vital you always act with an eye to the future. Think of the millions of dreams that are being shattered because of the climate catastrophes. As an advocate of climate action, I wish to remind you that the climate crisis is real. It is already destroying futures of children in Uganda and elsewhere. The world is grappling with the impacts of the climate crisis, but leaders are pretending like there is no crisis. I do not know how many city mayors or leaders gathered here today have declared climate emergencies in their cities. Are cities invulnerable to climate crisis? because over 70% of all emissions come from cities. I appreciate the efforts, the 100 C40 cities and the 1,000 more cities that signed up for the 1.5 degree target at COP26. But there are 10,000 cities in the world and this reminds us of how far we still have to go. My generation sent me to tell world leaders that they spend more time in meetings, conferences, and less in action. They are very good at pledging, but not implementing. They always speak about youth inclusion and participation, but they only include us for representation. Our input is barely considered in the final resolutions. They always say they have hope in young people but they never have us at the decision-making table. We are here today because we want you to make good use of that hope. We know exactly what is happening, the climate crisis, and we know that it, what it takes to combat it, urgent climate action. So the world should stop asking youth what needs to be done because 
for years and years, we have been saying it over and over again. And we will say it again today. Fellow youth, what do we want? When do we want it? Now. Whole house, what do we want? When do we want it? Now. Thank you. I call upon... I call upon leaders gathered here today to support youth who sacrifice everything to promote climate action. In my country, Uganda, I and fellow youth are empowering girls and women on the front lines of climate change. Why don't you join us? We are creating a climate movement that will not leave anyone behind, including cities. We owe it to the mountain gorillas, the birds, the lakes, the rivers, the bees, the forests, the elephants, and the like. I owe my being to the innocent children who are missing school right now, who are going to bed hungry, forced into early marriage, and dying of hunger due to climate change-induced disasters. I will conclude with a quote from Benjamin Franklin. He says, there are three types of people in the world. Those who are immovable. There are those who are movable. And there are those who move. In order to fight the climate crisis, we must have people who move. People who are willing to leave their comfort zones and make things happen. We owe it to future generations to live a life they will remember. What will you be remembered for? There is no better time for a second chance to rewrite our future than now. There is no better second chance to rewrite our future than now. We owe this to our generation. We owe it to future generation, and the time is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilda, uh, for those powerful words. The time is now, definitivamente. And thank you, Mark, for enlightening us with uh, the presentation that is a reminder of how significant the role of cities and mayors play in addressing the climate emergency. At the heart of C40 Sefer is the mayor of London and C40 chair Sadiq Khan. Upon assuming the position, Mayor Khan committing to align C40's budget and staffing behind the efforts to tackle air pollution worldwide and support emission reduction strategies, particularly in the global south cities on the front line of the climate crisis, putting social justice at the heart of his vision for C40 cities. Mayor Khan was one of the first leaders in the planet to declare a climate emergency. And he's championing the green and sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic from London City Hall. Reflecting the principles of a global Green New Deal, the mayor also introduced a Green New Deal for London to combat the climate and ecological emergencies and improve air quality, boost London's economy and tackle inequality. So please welcome to the stage, Mayor of London and C40 Chair, Mr. Sadiq Khan. Thank you, uh, Vanessa, for that, um, that uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, hello and good morning, uh, everyone. Hola, buenos dias. Welcome to the C40 
world's mayor's summit. The biggest gathering of mayors ever. The Harlem Globetrotters of mayors. You know, since this summit began this morning, I've heard the news uh, that my political opponent, the Conservative uh, Prime Minister of the UK, has resigned. Had I known... <laughs> had I known that uh, organising this summit could lead to the resignation <laughs> of the UK Prime Minister, I'd have organised this sooner. It's a, <laughs> it's a real pleasure, as you can tell. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here in uh, Buenos Aires uh, with you all. A city so steeped in culture and renowned for its uh, arts, for its uh, history, for its energy, and for its imagination. I'm going to start by thanking Mark Watts, the executive director of C40, to the C40 staff and to all the organizers for their hard work in staging this summit. I also have to thank uh, my dear friend, uh, Mayor Loretta, not only for his uh, opening remarks, his warm welcome and his hospitality, but for the climate leadership he is showing. Let's please have a round of applause for Mayor Loretta. And can I say to the Chief of Government of Buenos Aires, uh, Mayor Loretta, it is possible to have business and pleasure over the next uh, two days, and we promise to spend a lot of money in your city. <laughs> and as for, as for Hilda, wow. Uh, one of the reasons I suspect there is so much energy here is due to the presence of our youth activists. I want to thank you for inspiring us to do better and thank you for being around the table with us. From Sao Paulo to Seoul, from Accra to Dhaka, and Buenos Aires to Bogota, the picture since the last Mayor Summit in Copenhagen is one of progress. Our cities are stepping up and showing the, that ambitious climate action is possible. Mumbai, for example, is building on the pioneering work of Oslo by introducing climate budgeting. Tokyo is collaborating with Kuala Lumpur to develop low carbon building standards. Lagos is decarbonizing its energy supply by installing solar panels on schools and health centers. And in London, we've expanded our ultra-low emission zone 18-fold, covering 4 million Londoners and helping all Londoners breathe cleaner air. Taken together, our collective efforts are making a real difference, tackling air pollution, cutting carbon emissions, and improving the economic fairness economic fortunes, health, and well-being of our residents. Cities aren't just talking the talk, we're walking the walk. The examples our cities are showing shows that we can rise to meet the challenge of the climate crisis. Thanks to our track record of bold climate action, over 150 million residents in C40 cities are now benefiting from cleaner air. This stunning achievement illustrates that with political will, with concerted action, and with clarity of purpose, there is no limit to what we can do. There's no good reason why the international community can't keep the promise of 1.5 degrees to be alive. And yet, this crucial target hangs in the balance, because for all the progress our cities are making, too many national governments are still dragging their feet, refusing to commit to the policies 
to the regulation and clean energy investments that we know we need to do to avert catastrophic climate breakdown. Look, the climate emergency isn't a tomorrow issue. It's right here today on our doorstep. In London, we endured devastating fires this year caused by extreme heat. Across Europe, we've also seen deadly heat waves claim the lives of thousands of people. China experienced its most severe heat wave this summer since records began. And in Pakistan, we've witnessed appalling human suffering as terrible flooding linked to hotter temperatures has wrought havoc and misery on some of the world's poorest communities. The case of Pakistan underlines why I was so determined when I became chair last year to ensure that at least two thirds of the C40 budget goes to supporting cities in the global south. These are cities that are at the, that are at the sharp end of the crisis, but who bear the least responsibility for it. It's also why we must address the important issue of loss and damage for the cities and countries on the front lines of the climate emergency. The most frightening part, the most frightening part, however, is that everything we've seemed to have done so far is just a taste of things to come. And everything we've seen so far is just a taste of things to come. Because I'm afraid to say the science was wrong. The science was wrong, but not in the way climate deniers would have you believe. On the contrary, our climate is actually deteriorating at a much faster rate than even the most pessimistic climate models predicted. The science was wrong because they were too optimistic. The truth is, humankind is fast turning our climate into a weapon of mass destruction. One that becomes more powerful, more devastating, and more deadly with every passing year. And this is why London has joined other cities like Barcelona, Montreal, Paris, Los Angeles, and others, and signed the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. And as mayors of the biggest and most influential cities in the world, I want to take a stand at this summit today and say enough is enough. This scorched earth approach cannot continue. No to more fossil fuel investment. No to more fossil fuel subsidies. No to more fossil fuel exploration. We simply cannot be accomplices to our own destruction. We cannot be destroyers of our world. We need to move much faster to decarbonize our cities and societies and to make fossil fuels redundant once and for all. Now, of course, I know for some cities and countries, this isn't necessarily straightforward or easy. You feel domestic pressures to deprioritize climate action, especially with the cost of living crisis rising as a result of surging inflation and Russia's war against Ukraine. And this is why I want C40 to be a forum where we help each other navigate the path ahead. Because by working together, there is so much we can accomplish. There could be no better example of this than the announcement I'm about to make. Because today, I'm proud to announce that C40 cities are committing to supporting the delivery of 50 million good green jobs by the end of the decade. These jobs, <laughs> these jobs will be in the sustainable sectors from green construction and renewable energy generation to retrofitting and insulation. And they're proof that going green isn't just good for our planet, but good for our economy, good for our businesses, 
and working people too. In fact, C40 research shows that invest investing in renewables as opposed to fossil fuels creates more, better quality, secure jobs for our citizens. And it's also how we stay on track to meet our target of 1.5 degrees. And this is why accelerating a green and just transition is in everyone's interest. And we will work with our partners in business and the unions to deliver it. Friends, let me, let me end by saying this. As cities, we're showing the way forward, but with the national governments distracted, are not moving nearly fast enough, and with fossil fuel companies prepared to extract and weaponize more oil and gas, we cannot ease up, not even for a second. In the days ahead, we must reaffirm our commitment to bold, ambitious, urgent climate action. We must redouble our efforts, meeting words with deeds for the sake of the most vulnerable today, for our children and our children's children tomorrow. And as mayors of the world's largest cities, and yes, the world's best cities, representing hundreds of millions of citizens and a quarter of the global economy, we remain united. If we speak with one voice, if we discharge the duties we have to our citizens and our planet, then I firmly believe we can make a decisive difference in the fight. We can inspire others to follow where we lead. And we can cement this summit in the history books as a turning point in humanity's struggle against the climate crisis. Thank you. It is an honor now to introduce a video message from someone who is a friend of C40, a friend of uh, cities, and someone who is showing true leadership by urging the international community to step up and fulfill its climate obligations. The UN uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Dear friends, cities around the world are enduring a multitude of tests, from the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic to cascading food, energy and cost of living crises. Your leadership is essential to help achieve the sustainable development goals in this difficult context. Cities around the world also remain at the forefront of the climate emergency. As disasters continue to grow and intensify, our efforts to combat climate devastation are stalling. Our addiction to fossil fuels is intensifying. Greenhouse gas emissions are at an all-time high and rising. Current pledges and policies, particularly from the G20 countries, are shutting the door on our chance to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. Globally, we need to reduce emissions by at least 45% before the end of this decade. Current pledges by governments would result in an increase in emissions of 14% by 2030. This would be catastrophic. With more than half of the world's population, cities are where the climate battle will largely be won or lost. Cities consume more than two-thirds of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of global carbon dioxide emissions. Your citizens look to you to provide leadership, action and protection that is often lacking at the national level. First, I encourage you all to urgently reduce your carbon footprints during this critical decade. Set robust net zero emissions targets with detailed transition plans, policies and targets. Invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Use red tape for renewable energy projects and promote green and decent jobs and expand social protection. Second, I urge you to challenge companies and financial institutions in your cities to pledge and act credibly on zero commitments. And third, please invest in climate resilience. Half of all climate finance needs to flow to adaptation 
and every person on earth needs to be covered by effective early warning systems within the next five years. We have to save lives and livelihoods from the growing climate crisis. Finally, I ask you to use your powerful voices, influence and networks. Mobilize your citizens in support of a decarbonized climate resilient future. Engage your national governments to accelerate climate action. This starts at COP27 in just two weeks time. Every government, every business, every investor, every institution must step up. The world is counting on you and I thank you. What a great beginning for our summit and what a powerful message from Antonio Guterres. We truly thank him for his leadership and for saying it like it is. I would like to invite to the stage the mayor of Barcelona, Madam Adam Ara Colau. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you. Good morning. It is a true pleasure to be here with so many mayors from around the world. A great source of joy after COVID. Thank you once again to the team of C40 and to the team here in the city of Buenos Aires and its mayor for the magnificent organization of this event. As the vice chair of equity and climate justice of C40, I have uh, the role of welcoming you to this first high level session entitled United in Action for a Fair and Inclusive Transition. This session will explore how the mayors are implementing climate actions that tackle inequality and which build resilient and inclusive cities. Never before has it been more urgent to engage in climate action to reduce the cost of life, to create good jobs, and to guarantee social inclusion, as well as increasing the resilience of most people and particularly of those who are more vulnerable. Today, we will show that mayors are already doing this together with the civil society, with the unions, with the companies, with the young people whom we need to thank for their leadership. Thanks to them, we are showing how we have to carry forward a fair climate action. This is the best action to overcome the multiple crises that we face. It is simply impossible to overcome the climate crisis without tackling social, social injustices. But there's good news as well. Inequality, social justice, and climate crisis are all the results of one single crisis, which is the neoliberal economic system, which is clearly collapsing and is not working and not uh, guaranteeing the, the needs for most of the planet. So we need to change the economic system. That is the truth. And now to officially open this session and the program, we will hear from Sir David King. David King is the founder for the Center for Climate Reparation of the University of Cambridge. And beforehand, he uh, served as uh, permanent and as scientific advisors for the government of the United Kingdom. During this time, he raised awareness on the need of governments to act on climate collapse. David will be sharing with us a general vision of what science is saying and the need to accelerate the necessary actions to tackle the climate crisis and its multiple effects. This is why it is a great honor for me to welcome on stage Sir David King. Welcome. First of all, I, I want to say what an honor, yes, but what a wonderful opportunity it is for me to be addressing you today. 
I say opportunity because we are in a crisis. I hope that every one of you is not just applauding that wonderful young woman from Kampala, but is taking it on board. Because as a scientist, I'm going to say whether or not we can create a manageable future for our civilization depends on whether or not you listen to every word she said. And that's quite a tough call. I don't think any one of us, any society, any city is doing enough. And of course, I'm amazed at what C40 is achieving. But there we are. There's a great big step ahead of us now. So let me explain where I'm coming from. What is the temperature rise since the pre-industrial period today? We know that 1.5 is our target to stay below. And I was one of those negotiating in Paris to keep it there. We're over 1.3 degrees. It's not 1.1, it's not 1.2, it's we're over 1.3 degrees now, average for the whole planet. And the chances of staying below 1.5 are of course rapidly receding, but now I want to stress the point. We've all been hearing about the extreme weather events occurring around the planet. Now these extreme weather events aren't just temperatures 0.1 degrees centigrade above the previous record. These are in some places five, even 10 degrees centigrade above any civilization previously recording. So what is happening? And I just thought, you've probably heard enough about all these extreme weather events. First thing is to say, this is just the beginning. It's only going to get worse from now on in. But secondly, what is causing it? Now, I set up a climate crisis advisory group, which is the senior climate scientists from around the world. It's only 16 of us. It's a very agile group. And yet we represent the climate science leaders of the world from 12 different countries, just 16 people. And we have so far produced eight reports. In our second report last year, published at the end of August, we provided an explanation for the extreme weather events occurring around the Northern Hemisphere during last August and July last year. And what, what did we attribute it to? It's what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. Now we seem down here closer to the Antarctic than to the Arctic, of course. But nevertheless, what is happening in the Arctic Circle now is threatening the future of the whole planet. So let me explain that very quickly, because I only have a short time. The Arctic Circle has been losing ice more rapidly than we, the climate scientists, predicted years ago. And so today, during the Arctic summer, which is just three months of the year when the sun moves up to the north, we lose all the ice that is formed over about 50% of the Arctic Sea in a few days. Just a thin layer of ice formed during the previous winter. And so the Blue Sea, is now exposed around the North Pole to the sunlight. And that sun shines there much of the day during the Arctic summer. And so the net result is that the temperature of the air above the North Pole region is now warmer than many other regions. Now what, what that is doing is driving the cold air in the Arctic Circle further north. So we're into this strange phenomenon where Texas has now twice experienced temperatures of minus 12 and minus 15 degrees centigrade in successive years. That's the cold air being pushed down from the Arctic Circle into Dallas, Texas and the, and the rest. So what, what is happening there is that as that cold air gets pushed down, warm air comes up from the tropics to replace that cold air. So you've got warm air, cold air being pushed down and then warm air coming up. Now I'm providing you with this explanation because we also had in North America last summer temperatures that were five degrees in excess of any previous record. You will have seen that Lytton in British Columbia, which is a cold town in British Columbia, experienced temperatures of 49.9 degrees centigrade for some period of time. 
And that is what was happening. We have a, a wind blowing around the Arctic Circle, the jet stream. And that wind is virtually, or has been, virtually circular, anti-clockwise, keeping cold air in at the Arctic Circle region and warm air out. And what has happened is that with the warm air over the North Pole, that jet stream is now terribly distorted. In some places, it's going south-north. And so we got the jet stream locked in alongside the west coast of America. And that locked in a very high temperature all the way up that west coast. Now, what I'm going to say to you is, I believe these extreme weather events we're hearing about around the world, whether it's in Bangladesh or uh, as, as we've seen in Pakistan, all of these severe storms, unusual weather, is because the global weather system is in transition as a result of what's happening in the Arctic Circle region. So here's the problem. 1.5 degrees was a very good target, but it assumed that the whole planet was warming up evenly. The Arctic Circle region as a whole Average temperature rise globally and annually, sorry, average temperature rise for that region annually is now just over three degrees centigrade above the pre industrial level. So, what has happened? The tipping point of the Arctic Circle that we climate scientists have predicted was a little way off yet has now broken. The Arctic Circle has gone. And so, the net result is that these catastrophic events can only get worse. There's a lot more ice up there to melt, and that region can only get warmer as we move forward. Imagine having a North Pole as one of the warmer regions of the Northern Hemisphere. And that's what we seem to have in line for us. So I, I think what I, I want to say here is, what is happening already is catastrophic for the whole planet. Now, what action is required? And this is global action of the kind we are hearing discussed now. We all need to be pulling together on this. There's uh, no section of our community that can be left out of this struggle to create a manageable future for humanity. The first is deep and rapid emissions reduction. There's nothing new there. That's the pathway you're on. But now remember what I'm going to say. Every further ton of greenhouse gases, every further ton of carbon dioxide you put into the atmosphere will have to be removed. We won't have a manageable future if we keep adding to what's already there. There is a possibility of staying average below 1.5, but I hope I've explained to you that average is now a bit meaningless because of what's happened in the Arctic Circle region. So we have to go to the next part of the strategy. It's a three-hour strategy set out by the Climate Crisis Advisory Group. First, reduce. The second R is remove excess greenhouse gases from the air. From that, we've already put too much up there. Let me support the voice from Kampala. That's what we have been doing for the last 150 years. We've put too much up there, and we're going to have to work goddamn hard to pull it down again. We, we're in excess of 500 parts per million of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The pre-industrial level was 270. What, what could we expect but this kind of massive change in the climate weather systems of the world? And so we need to pull it down, I believe, to less than 350 parts per million. That's a very big task. And the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge that I set up is now working on technologies and processes we can use to manage that, that challenge. But the third R is the one that raises most eyebrows. We've gone too far, so we have to repair the damage we've already done to the climate system. So the third R is about immediately, how can we refreeze the Arctic Circle region? How can we keep that layer of ice that forms over the Arctic Sea right through the Arctic summer? And the way we're looking at it is to see if we can create white cloud cover 
over the whole of the Arctic Circle region for the three months of the polar summer. White cloud very effectively reflects sunlight back into space the way snow does. And so the blue sea should not be re-exposed if we can manage that. And of course, yes, that's a big task. But we're at the beginning stages of developing these technologies. Now, I, I want to just say, there's the hope. There is a way forward. Yes, we have to have resilience. There's a fourth R in there as well, because the impacts of climate change are going to roll out, and I'm afraid get worse than they are now, before we can actually manage this task. The business of refreezing the Arctic is frankly to buy time while we reduce emissions and while we pump greenhouse gases back out of the atmosphere. We can do this, I believe scientifically we can manage this, but it is going to require a tremendous effort from all of us. Now, I, I do want to emphasize this, but let me say, this is not a hopeless story at all. I think now that we understand, and many, many more of us understand the nature of the challenge and the nature of the voice from Kampala, we, we really can pull together and act. Now, I'm putting on a, a master class for the, the mayors uh, tomorrow at 11.30, and I very much hope we have a wonderful discussion there. Thank you. Muchas gracias, uh, Sir David King. Thank you very much, Sir David King. Science has spoken very clearly. We need to move fast with greater ambition and commitment to avoid climate collapse. And cities play a key and essential role in the creation of a future that puts people and the planet as a priority. The first conversation of this forum today will focus on how cities can turn scientific goals into actions that leave no one behind. We will get to know the leaders who work to ensure that this transition involves environmental justice as the center, as the priority. Let us welcome our panelists, climate leader Pamela Escobar Vargas the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, and our moderator as well, climate journalist Thais Gadea Lara. Welcome to the stage. Mayor, once again, welcome. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a good time. And it's great to speak after a scientist, because I think that any action for climate change must be science-based, and any climate change action must be fair. So that will be the topic of this next conversation, entitled Preparing Together the Road Towards Climate Justice. And I am honored to be joined by two women who have been working on this subject from their two positions. And I would like to emphasize the fact that they are women, because we do need women in decision-making spaces for climate action, and we need climate action with a gender perspective. We will be having a discussion based on their experiences and trying to understand how fair climate actions is and must be an opportunity to improve the well-being of everyone, because this is what it is about, about leaving no one behind in climate actions. You just heard uh, the words of Mayor Ada Colau from Barcelona, who had the first role as an activist and a defender of human rights, working towards the reduction of inequalities and to promote models in the cities that are sustainable and based on a climate justice principle. Also, to provide the youth perspective, we have Pamela Escobar Vargas, who is an activist from Mexico, and she's a member of the World Youth uh, Forum, and she is the co-founder of Fridays for Future Mexico. A true pleasure to be having this conversation. 
Mayor, C40 is working towards climate action, but this should also serve the purpose of bridging inequalities. What things should be taken into account to ensure an efficient climate action? And based on your experience in Barcelona, how do we tackle the challenges when we face people who are most vulnerable? Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's a great honor to be here. I think that before we focus on what is being done specifically in the cities, which of course I can provide examples of things with the perspective of climate justice, but I think that first and foremost we must uh, make a prior consideration. I don't beat around the bush. I speak very clearly in general. That is my style. I've been more of a social activist than a mayor, so I still do that. I think things should be called with their proper name. And as I said at the beginning of this block, sometimes we have natural phenomena, but most of the phenomena that we see are human caused. And the actions that are being developed by humans are destroying the planet and creating more and more social injustice, colonialism and other uh, scourges. So we need to position ourselves there and talk about the social justice and climate justice. I have two children. One is five years old, but the other one is 11. And we do talk about these matters. And I try to explain that the rising temperatures in the world are caused by human actions, pollution, etc. And he says, it's not my fault. I haven't done anything. And he's right. He's 11 years old. And he's constantly hearing these speeches that are so catastrophic and that claim that their future is not certain because of humanity. And humanity is to blame, but not all of humanity. I think some are more guilty than others, and that needs to be said clearly. It is the action of a few who are obtaining obscene amount of wealth at the expense of the planet and the expense of more and more inequality. The data indicates that five countries emit 60% of the worldwide emissions and that only 20 companies emit 35% of those emissions. So we need to put a name and a last name to things, to say things clearly and as they are. Because as cities who are very close to the citizens, we require more and more efforts. Reduce the use of plastic, use your car less, change your consumption patterns and habits, uh, reduce the use of waste, recycle more. We ask a lot from citizens and citizens answer. So what about really going after those who are truly responsible, the oil companies, the power generation companies who are increasing their profit in the midst of an energy crisis. Families cannot pay their electricity bill. When is it time to intervene with them? When will we engage in political actions for those who are responsible to reduce their profit and take on their actual responsibility? I think that democratic authorities and particularly cities who, like I said, are closer to the citizens must raise our voices in international forums such as this one. We can talk about what we do, but as the mayor, I'm the spokesperson of the citizens of my city. And I think that we need to focus on those who are most responsible for these emissions. And this is not happening. We need to say things clearly. OK, so what's going to happen in two weeks' time with COP27, right? Let's see if they put money on the table for countries who really need so. Uh, along the lines with what Pamela said, you, in, in your youth uh, viewpoint and considering who is responsible in a generation that without choosing it, really, <clears throat> had to act and demand actions. So what is your point of view in terms of climate justice and how cities can actually work with the youth or the youth with cities for a more equitable than <clears throat> climate uh, justice. It's firstly, it's an honor being here, sharing this panel with you. Climate justice is uh, life or death, really. It is the core of the resistance of environmental movements, the power of society, and those groups who defend life. And since it's complex, it includes different elements, like, for instance, the recognition, as already said by the mayor, the current economic system, the neoliberal 
system is unfair. We cannot continue with the criteria of overproduction, overconsumption, and mercantilization of life and this unlimited economic growth. This would recognize the cosmovisions, especially of the southern south of the indigenous people. We are the ones who have to learn from them, really. <clears throat> Climate justice should also mean to remedy losses and damages, especially players from the capitalism like like cross-border companies and those who actually hog the wealth. We can't talk about justice when 10% of the richest um, populations have the 10% of all the wealth because 1% of the population pollutes more than the rest. So there has to be economic redistribution and a regulation of the financial monopolistic power. Climate justice must include greater connection between all the society actors, including the youth. And answering to your second question, I believe that all mayors or decision makers should include those demands and the participation of youth in the different spaces that make them up because we are the present and we are also the future and they have to believe in our capacity to act because just as we take the streets, we also prepare ourselves academically and professionally. An example of this could be the C4 Youth and Mayors Forum, the C40 Global Youth and Mayors Forum. We do different activities with mayors. So mayor, you just said it because you have more experience in being an activist. The fact that what happens we have an event or a panel with the youth, and we there's a round of applause after a speech, but they're, they're not at the decision-making table. How do you think we should work from the cities with the youth, considering what we want, which is a just and equitable climate action? Well, we have thought about this vision as well as gender and diversity in all the climate policy we are developing in Barcelona. When we did it before the pandemic, the climate emergency decree we convened a representation of the citizenry to do a follow-up of that executive decree to be not something in writing but also in specific actions. Now we have the citizenry assembly, an assembly with 100 citizens between 16 years of age and 75. This was done as a draw, and that citizen assembly will be deliberating and marking the role and the path of climate actions together with the municipality. So we clearly think we've lived it firsthand. I mean, in the city, we are already doing things that they said we couldn't do before because there's no competition in energy policies, but we have created a public-owned um, municipal, uh, let's say, company to provide uh, this green energy. So all the lighting should be 100% green, but we can also provide to private people, individuals, small and medium-sized companies reducing uh, a lot the bills. We just want to guarantee access. This is just an example of the different policies we're carrying forth. Also, we raise our voices to be the, the governments who regulate the electric market, market and to f also on only fund renewables and without giving any subsidies to contaminating energy. So we do both things. So there is a bearing on the one hand, but we also move forward doing many things in terms of the city. And what happens, it is paramount that the citizenry, especially the youth, be active, be in the first line in terms of demands because all of a sudden we have the government that pressures us because of some economic interests and they want to, for instance, expand and the Barcelona airport instead of in, in expanding the investment in public transportation thanks to the young led by the young we don't want a model of the of the past we want to conquer the future we need public transportation we need we need trains we need investment in renewables we don't have to expand airports an action that was supposed to be done because of a lobbying uh, 
top down with the municipalities and the citizenry, we were able to halt it and we are demanding to invest in that which we need, which is public transportation. So getting involved is useful, of course. Along the lines of what you said, Pamela, not only do you go to the streets, but you're preparing yourselves academically speaking and to have certain positions. So uh, Sadiq Khan, the mayor, said that there were 50 million new green jobs towards the end of the decade. So what should you guaranteed or what changes should be done so that you can access the labor or employment market and to be positions that support climate action. I think that the decision makers and mayors should include all this capacity and young talent. So in doing so, they need to know their young population because, as I said earlier, there's a lot of talent in different cities that make up the planet. And I do believe that this should go hand in hand with prior training and strengthening of intellectual skills and moral skills. Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon we have to change the world. And the most important resistance there is, is an informed society. I also consider it is relevant because we cannot allow the young to have more difficulties to access the employment market because we are the ones who build the pillars of climate justice, the one we fight for today. An example that could work is probably from the Young Climate Councils, an idea promoted by C40, and it is seen in the Global Youth and Mayors Forum, where the youth can have different activities. It could be even a link or a connection to subsequently part of a job. But undoubtedly, mayors, decision makers must consider us as active agents and not passive agents that can only listen or can only look at some decisions being taken. We have to be there participating because the bottom line is that we are the ones who suffer and who will suffer the climate change consequences as well as an economic system that is so perverse and that continues enabling such inequality till today and so many different problems. We must recall that we are experiencing multiple economic crises, social, political, health-wise. So we have to work all together in this action, intersectorally, intergenerationally, and multidisciplinarily. In closing, because we are on time, uh, in a tweet, what, what, what advice will you give the audience at the other side of the screen to get involved in this? In a tweet, uh, by, via Twitter, uh, because uh, not in a thread, because we are on time. Well, of course, we carry a hopeful message. Of course, you can change. The idea is political will is necessary, and we must refound democracy. Cities, we are the perfect place. We are the closest to the citizenry, and together, we can do it. And in addition, it's an opportunity because there could be jobs, stable jobs in an economy that is really green and to and it's post-capitalist. This is perfectly possible. And every day we we delay, this is something against our children and grandchildren. Pamela, crisis, climate crisis is the greatest threat we face as humanity. We cannot wait for more FARA or summits to take action. When the mayors and decision makers choose to act, they're choosing a death system that only causes suffering, especially towards the global south and the oppressed. I invite you to act from as of today towards a structural change, systemic, post-capitalistic system. Thank you. I agree. Pamela, thank you. Thank you all. I thank you for your attention and climate action will be successful only if it is just and leaving nobody behind. Thank you. Gracias, Thais. Gracias, Alcat. Thank you, Thais. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Pamela. What an important conversation, really. Uh, very inspiring. I think that environmental justice cannot be achieved without the collaboration, and teamwork is essential to ensure a transition that includes all. ...ambitious and transformative action needed to confront the climate emergency. 
And here, at C40 World Mayor Summit, city leaders have the opportunity to exchange best practices and lessons learned with one another. Over the course of the summit, we will feature short presentations that spotlight tangible and impactful solutions that are underway in cities around the world. You will hear from mayors and city leaders who are implementing significant policies and initiatives in a variety of sectors to improve the quality of life of all the city residents. You all know our next speaker quite well, a former C40 chair who launched the Global Green New Deal program during his tenure helping to build and expand the coalition and support needed to deliver inclusive climate actions in cities around the world. Please welcome to the stage, El Alcalde de Los Angeles, El Señor Eric Garcetti. Mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti. Muy buenos días a todos y gracias. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mayor Larreta. And thank you to the city of Buenos Aires for their hospitality. Stand up for a minute. You've been sitting for so long. Shake it out. Get the blood flowing. It's bad for us. Kick your legs around. Stretch, twist. All right, now you can sit down again. Now, now I just want to make sure you stay awake for this, but good morning, C40. Buenos dias, C40. Gracias, uh, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa, for your introduction. And it is so great to be back together in person. In Copenhagen, just over two years ago, I came before you on a stage just like this to say that the 2020s had to be the climate decade, a decade of action, a decade, as our young people have said, not just of coming together and taking pictures and giving hugs, but of taking actions to save our lives and of our planet. And I want to thank Mayor Larreta for his hospitality, Mayor Khan for his beautiful leadership, and I want to thank Mark Watts and the entire C40 team and funders for making these gatherings that are critical to this hinge of history possible. I also want to say that it is important for us to come together here in the Global South, something we made a commitment to changing as an organization and leading from the bottom up, whether it's in our planet from the South up or in our communities from the most vulnerable out. And I am convinced when we do come together face to face that our work is amplified, our ideas are broadened and our urgency is redoubled. So I have a presentation about my city with pictures to keep you awake. I come from a city that everyone in the world knows, whether you've actually been to Los Angeles or not. You've seen us in movies and television shows. You know us, of course, for our beautiful weather, our incredible beaches, our diverse population. But you know us also because we are home to Hollywood, both an industry that makes bright stars and great stories but also a neighborhood as well. So let me tell you a new Hollywood story, a story that is Oscar worthy, one that is a little different maybe from what you know, but one that's also writing a new script on our future. Now LA has been well documented in movies. Our engineering of a giant aqueduct to steal water from elsewhere for our thirsty city to grow was the star of the famous movie Chinatown. But what's lesser known and hiding in plain sight in my city is another part of our city's growth bigger than Hollywood and the movie industry, that of oil. Long before the first director in Hollywood shouted action to film movies, LA was a huge oil town. First discovered in the 1870s, LA soon found oil everywhere. And to this day, Los Angeles has one of the largest urban oil fields anywhere in the United States and the largest in the world. Oil drilling changed the face of our city. Literally, as you can see, everywhere you looked, oil wells were found everywhere. In the backyards of people's homes, in neighborhoods east, west, north, and south. And by the 1920s, you may not know this, Los Angeles produced 25% of the world's, you heard that right, of the world's oil. And these endless reservoirs of liquid gold stretch from downtown to Venice Beach, from our San Fernando Valley, to our port in Long Beach. And this liquid gold fueled our ambition, filled our coffers, and cemented at the same time our collective global fate. Because we all know these huge profits, as Hilda so powerfully said, come at an even greater cost. And our people paid that cost, experiencing increased rates of cancer, respiratory ailments, 
and premature death. Our environment paid as we pumped out pollution until it hung heavy in the air, and we cut trees down to put oil derricks up. Now, of course, our global climate has suffered as well, the devastated impacts of sustained burning of fossil fuels. And as mayors, we are firsthand witnesses on the front lines of this climate crisis, the burning fires, the flooded streets. The dirty truth is we have been addicted to oil. And as is too often the case with addiction, we had to hit rock bottom before we realized the problem. Now we can begin a long journey to recovery, a cleaner, a greener, a more equitable future. In Los Angeles, to break the cycle, we had to cut the cord. After decades of suffering, years of organizing, advocating, and agitating, we called it quits. And I'm proud to say that this year we announced, and I signed legislation to end oil drilling once and for all in the city of Los Angeles. Oil drilling happening in our lowest income communities, communities of color. And I'm here today to say it is not despite, but because of our history and the ways we have benefited from the boon of oil production, that we have a moral duty to lead as a city, to inspire a nation and a world, a hemisphere to follow. As chair of C40, my priority, priority area of focus was pushing forward a global Green New Deal, something that would be constituted by Green New Deals in each one of these cities before us. Green prints for our ecology, our economy, and for equity. Models of a just transition from the old world to a brave new one. And to support this historic work, C40, with funding from the Open Society Foundation, launched phase one of the Global Green New Deal Pilot Implementation Initiative. It's a mouthful. But demonstrating what a Global Green New Deal looks like in practice, we are we're bringing to bear the remarkable creativity, commitment, and courage of these mayors here today in Los Angeles, in Accra, in Barcelona, in Warsaw, in Durban, in Joburg, in Cape Town, Shwani, in Ikulurani, and in Bangalore. And the principle is clear. We'll give you resources if you take action. Not tomorrow, not down the line, not decades from now, but right now. To save our cities, to build our economies, and to acknowledge and take responsibility as we lift up our most vulnerable workers and communities who are bearing the brunt of climate impacts. So in Los Angeles, where we used to refine oil, we're now refining ideas. The green and just practices that not just produce emissions, but that produce new conditions. Longer lives, better jobs, and more equitable communities. What's not to love? In Los Angeles, the most powerful way we are doing this is by sprinting to 100% clean power by 2035, and we will be 97% of the way there by the end of this decade. When I started as elected official in Los Angeles, we were 2% renewable. By the end of this decade, we will be 97% carbon free. And we acknowledged in our race to zero, joining together the 1,000 plus cities that I called on from around this world to come together, cities small, medium, and large, to bring along those workers in these industries. We have oil workers today in Los Angeles. We can't ignore them or leave them behind. Those folks that are in the legacy industries that built our cities, must be in the legacy industries that will save our cities as well. So we created a Just Transition Task Force, something I recommend in your city, where you actually hone in on the individuals, not the statistics or the overall balance of jobs, but the individuals and their families so that they can join us as part of this team instead of opposing it. We brought together unions, indigenous leaders, industry, environmental justice advocates, youth, and Hilda, I have answers to your questions at the end of my speech a more equitable solution to remediation. But we're not stopping there. We held community conversations. We received suggestions. And as a result, we've set up a climate equity fund, millions of dollars we are spending today to hire and train underrepresented workers and displaced workers to retrofit buildings for energy efficiency who might have been working in a refinery just yesterday. And we're focusing our solutions to combat climate change in the most vulnerable communities who are most affected first. For instance, instead of planting trees in all council districts equally, we're looking at those places that don't have trees today. Maybe it was too black of a community, too poor of a community, too indigenous of a community. But there is a senior citizen trying to get to the market waiting for a bus in the blazing sun and she can't get there. A student who comes home from school and because that heat is so intense without a tree, she won't do her homework and maybe not graduate from high school. If you don't put equity into your action every step of the way, you will miss this moment and miss this transition. 
We launched our groundbreaking LA100 study, bringing together the United States' National Renewable Energy Lab, which is a ton of amazing science, uh, scientists, climate geeks, and a supercomputer. We literally ran millions of scenarios to prove that this could be done. We run, ran these simulations until we fast-tracked our race to 100% clean power and also figured out the tens of thousands of jobs that will be part of the 50 million uh, job pledge that Mayor Khan mentioned today. In fact, we set a goal of 20,000. In two years, we've created 63,000 new, good, paying, green jobs. So how will we achieve this? We're going to hit the five zeros. Zero carbon buildings, zero carbon electricity, zero carbon transportation, zero waste, and zero wasted water. I know we're a little behind, so I'm going to skip the details. Go check out our Green New Deal to look at the ways you do that. But literally, we are taking water and a drought and heat and making sure that Los Angeles will have double the water supply by recycling it taking all of our buildings, new ones will all be, of course, zero carbon, but we're retrofitting the old ones. And I've already told you what we're doing with electricity and with waste. As we look at the future, I wanted to answer though, Hilda. Hilda, are you out there still? So you asked the question, and I hope every mayor will respond. Did we declare a climate emergency? In the city of Los Angeles, yes. We are proud to be the first big city in the world to say, this isn't a crisis, this is an emergency, and set up a department around that. Second, will we end our addiction to oil? Yes, we are banning oil drilling in the city of Los Angeles. And third, will we have youth not just sprinkled in here for photo ops? Yes, I was proud as chair of this organization to not only start this youth conversation, but in Los Angeles, we have a youth climate council that are my advisors and action takers, not just folks to come together once in a while who meet regularly. I sat down with them privately just a week and a half ago before coming to this conference. That's the sort of model we need, and we have to answer to our youth, not just to say great speech, but these are powerful actions. Benjamin Franklin, who you quoted, once said, the best way to make a friend is to ask somebody a favor. You've asked us to take action, and I hope you will consider us your friend. Because when mayors come together with young people, we are absolutely unstoppable. Let me conclude where I started. We began this conversation with oil before our redemption arc began. And I want you to think, if you can, just imagine for a moment we're living maybe in the late 19th century. Before there's one person working to extract oil. There's no workers in oil refineries because they don't exist. There's no streets paved with asphalt. There's no driving instructors. There's no car mechanics. Think about that moment if you were living then as a human being, the revolution that was about to come and how it changed life, how it fueled the industrial revolution. We didn't know the sins it would bring, but think about what it felt like then. Now, come to today. That is the moment you are living in. The jobs we don't know, the way we will live that we have not seen, we are on that same brink of a revolution. The question is, will you watch it happen or will you make it happen? Will you wait for someone else to do it or will you be the revolutionary that brings it about? There's a quote from one of my favorite writers. It's about the Italian artist, Andrea del Sarto, and it's by the poet Robert Browning. And he wrote, and I'll paraphrase, a person's reach must always exceed their grasp. In other words, we reach for things we may not hold. The slave who fights for her freedom but dies before she tastes it so that her grandchild or great-grandchild may be free. A woman who says we deserve to vote but never gets to vote but her descendants are today. This is what the story of human history is. This is one of those moments where we have to reach beyond our grasp. Maybe what Sir John said about, Sir David, excuse me, uh, said about our future gives us nightmares like Mary Dalgo and I were saying up there. But maybe, just maybe, if we accelerate this, we can hold that future. We can hold that moment. And this room, somebody alive in here, will see that day when our dreams actually come true. Because the second line of that poem says, after all, what is a heaven for? My friends, after all, why else are we here? Let us hold that future together. Thank you.
The Global Green New Deal pilot initiative supports nine cities, soon ten, across the world in different regions and in different countries to understand what inclusive and equitable climate action is and to put it in practice in different geographies and different cultures and different political situations in the world. True priority, you know. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, so we be renew former sector, no, or more contract am our more. And so so we do informal sector, no. And so so be shebe. Ah, nan cafe, so no enter sa. Estamos creando una red de 200 refugios climáticos para que todo el mundo en la ciudad tenga a menos de 10 minutos de su casa un lugar fresco, un lugar saludable, donde haya verde, donde haya acceso al agua y una temperatura soportable. This pilot, it's also helped us understand the labor market impacts of phasing out oil drilling and the needs of workers in frontline communities. It's very important that workers are included in the fossil fuel phase out. If you're not at the table, then you're on the menu. The pilot has helped to emphasize and advocate the role of local government in a just transition. C40 supported cities are better able to influence national policy on just transition and to engage with the Presidential Climate Change Commission. Our solution is that we combine energy advisors with social workers, because social workers exactly know where low income communities live in Warsaw. The Smog Stop program has helped us to accelerate our action to tackle social inequality and climate change at the same time. Cities and mayors are actually delivering. They can inspire thousands of other cities in the world to deliver inclusive and equitable climate action for all. Thank you, Mayor Garcetti. Gracias por su liderazgo. Gracias por su Thank you for your leadership and your work. The final segment is on Accra, Ghana, which has become a global leader in waste management and ensuring a just transition for informal workers. Please join me in welcoming our next presenter, the mayor of Accra, Elizabeth Saki. Buenos días. If you get to a country and you don't know how to say good morning, you are in trouble. And you don't know how to say hello, you are in trouble. So, hola. Good morning. I bring you greetings from Accra. Inclusive collaboration action is key to the delivery of a just transition that leaves no one behind. Since 2021, the city of Accra has been implementing the inclusive climate action program with support from C40 cities. The program in Accra is working to strengthen collaborate between the city and the informal waste sector for climate resilience. Informal waste actor contributes to Accra green transition and help to achieve low carbon development through waste management. This program has showcased a new approach to informal labor integration, which prioritizes the voice visibility and participation of informal waste actors. It has led to in 
issue identification from the informal waste sector perspective. An example we will adopt in other area of climate action. Consequently, the city has supported capacity development of informal waste workers and city urban planners. Additionally, we are working to incorporate waste contracts and concessions for informal waste cooperatives. Through the program, we have recognized that the challenge of informality in waste service delivery is many side. Hence, we are addressing the challenges in ways that tackle multiple inequalities and support an inclusive transition to a greener, more resilient city. This includes working with regional stakeholders to advocate for a regional policy to support informal waste sector integration. Just transition as an, as an inclusive approach to addressing the cl climate crisis and is at the intersection of climate change, labor, and inequality. In Accra, this means building a more recognized informal waste sector to support emission reduction in the city and enable more safeguarded informal jobs. In recent years, we have prioritized the informal waste sector's contribution to climate action. Their work is central to our local adoption and climate resilience efforts. And we are keen to continue to prioritize the recognition, representation, and participation of informal waste actors in the city's waste policy discourse and action. By doing this, we are optimistic of co-creating solutions to enhance the informal waste sector's access to the benefit of climate action like clean air, more safeguard jobs and livelihood, social protection and safer communities. This reality is recognized by many cities around the world with large informal worker populations surrounding the delivery of their key services. For this reason, in November 2022, our city will open a store and welcome the city of Rio, Lagos, and Bangalore that are also striving to better understand the role of informal workers in the just transition. We will, by hosting an inclusive climate action academy to bring our peers cities to Accra so we can learn from each other, from key experts and share our best practices and recommendations on what delivering a just transition looks like in practice. Through our inclusive climate action work, we also observe how some demographic groups are dis disproportionate, disproportionately rep represent in the informal sector and often more vulnerable to relate risk. For instance, in countries and international migrants, some of who have migrated due to climate events are highly represented in informal markets, including the informal waste sector in Accra. Currently, the city is taking action to the response to identify migrant-specific urban development challenges in the informal waste sector. This action aims to improve child care facility for children of migrant informal waste work migrant informal waste workers and fa facilitate migrant informal waste workers access to healthcare and financial inclusion with the city. This will continue to improving 
the city's overall waste management as well as improve local adaptation and climate resilience. This work is supported by the Mayor's Migration Council through the Global City Fund. Last month, we kicked off the development of an integrated community-based waste management model for source separation and composting with support from the C40 Cities Finance Facility facility. This project will impact 140,000 households in three low-income communities and create about 200 green jobs for informal work sector workers. When we talk about good job opportunities at the summit, let us also talk about the vital livelihood for informal sector workers and the contribution they make to our, our community transition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mayor Saki, for your remarks. Cities are showing that climate action can also address social inequalities and ensure the most vulnerable people benefit from and are included in local policy making. The COVID-19 pandemic and other economic and social crises have demonstrated that well-being can be an effective benchmark for how to plan, assess and design our cities. Well-being focused cities develop a holistic policy and structures that prioritize residents' needs and empower them to live healthy and fulfilling lives. They deliver these policies with the help and input of local community and members of the civil society, a collaborative approach that delivers multiple benefits for city residents. Our next panel will highlight how cities can work with a diverse group of partners to develop and implement inclusive climate actions that centers the well-being of people and communities. So please give a warm welcome to our panelists. Steve Letzike, founder and executive director of Access Chapter 2. The mayor of Phoenix, Kate Gallego. Mayor of Bogota, la alcaldesa Claudia López Hernández. Mayor of Seúl, O. Seijun and Milang San Jose Ballesteros, Regional Director for East Southeast Asia and Oceania and Global South Diversity Lead at C40. Bienvenidos. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Buenos dias, magandang umaga, and that's in my mind. I also it's not just good morning, it's Good afternoon for others and good evening for those who are watching us on live stream. We, uh, I was advised by the team that uh, we have now 7,000 views, 7,000 people watching other than those in the room right now. And that says a lot in terms of what this means and uh, the, the topic of our conversation. So I'm happy to uh, moderate. Um, with, with a great set of, pine, of, uh, of uh, panelists. Our, um, our session is, a, is entitled Cities and Communities Leading Together to Ensure the Well-Being of Everyone. And joining us this morning is, of course, uh, Mayor uh, Claudia Lopez, uh, the co-chair of C40's Global Youth and Mayors Forum, and of course known as a real champion in terms of embedding equity in how Bogota approaches its planning, its strategies, and its programs and actions. And of course, we have Mayor Kate Gallego from, uh, from Phoenix, a passionate uh, mayor that really wants to make Phoenix a leading um, climate and sustainability city in the U.S. and very much devoted, of course, in terms of making sure that all Phoenicians uh, have a better quality of life. The other, um, of course, is uh, joining us, talking about commitment to this dialogue 
And to this conversation on community and equity, we have the mayor of Seoul, Mayor Oh si Hoon, who's actually joining at almost 11.30 p.m. midnight <laughs> in Seoul. Kam sa Hameda, Mayor Oh. Thank you. Last, last but not uh, the least, we are very fortunate to have uh, Steve Litsike, uh, who, is, uh, who will share her thoughts and views and perspectives as a, uh, as a real champion and a, uh, a, strong, um, with an imp a strong representative of the civil society with an impressive track in terms of human rights advocacy. So again, thank you very much, Steve, for, uh, for joining us. I know we've had a chat and, uh, and similarly with the mayors here, we could really spend time a lot longer uh, in terms of discussing what it means in terms of working with cities and communities. So maybe just starting off, and we're in Latin America right now, I think it, it would be evident to everyone we're actually out here representing four continents. And so I just wanted to, um, to ask, uh, let's, let's start off. Um, uh, Mayor, uh, uh, Mayor Lopez, in terms of your thoughts as far as, uh, as far as looking at really embedding equity or what it means for cities to actually work on, um, on, uh, on equity in terms of uh, looking at, you know, examples from your city. Could you tell us how mayors um, use their powers in terms of enabling, collaborating, inspiring, but I think more importantly, co-creating and co-delivering transformative actions that does not just address the climate crisis, but also the pandemic as well as the economic crisis that's being felt right now. So maybe over to you first, uh, uh, Mayor Lopez. Bueno, mil, mil Thank you so much. I've been speaking in English for a day and a half, but I'm in Buenos Aires. Let me honor this a city. Good morning, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you for welcoming us with such love, but especially with such energy and action. I believe that the multiple crises, uh, as commented by the youth this morning, talk about urgency. There's no time to waste. We have to add efforts, including, I should say, efforts of those who probably would not be applauded uh, in this event if we had the, the, the managers of the 25 companies, main responsible people for the use of fossil fuels or energies, I'm sure you would not applaud them. But they're not here, and if they're not here and we don't commit with them to accelerate transformation and save the planet, we will not achieve it. So I do believe that what we must do is to lead the conversation, a candid conversation, but empathetic as well and specific in order to agree on action actions and to distribute tasks. National governments, I believe, have a lot more capacity to agree on the great global transformations in the industry because it is the industry first, second, third, or fourth generation in terms of technology is global. It is national, but it's also global. It acts and produces locally, but at that level, it's the greatest, the, the greatest responsibility of national governments. We on the other hand, cities, what we have to do is use that magic, which is proximity. Cities are, by definition, we are a cluster of human beings that we join diversities, talents, knowledge in order to produce, to create, to co-create. So this proximity, co-creation, that is the magic of any city, regardless of their, si of their size. And that's where we have to be able, I believe, to lead us mayors. And thirdly, the young, the youth, women, and children, undoubtedly, they are the mostly impacted by all these crises in any country but also the ones who have the energy and the real sense of urgency to make these transformations happen. And I believe they're the ones who have to go to the streets to teach us. Nothing is hardest in the life of a human being than to change their habits. And climate change is done by our own habits, us human beings, not that of ants or tigers or of the birds is us as a humanity and they're the children, the teenagers 
who are there, always available in life, to change and to have uh, new uh, habits. So as mayors, we have to convince the children and teenagers to have a new education in the 21st century. The education was to take them to their rooms for adults to educate them the classrooms, and it's the other way around. We have to get the children and teenagers out of those classrooms, into the class, into the streets to re-educate, at home and in the streets, to re-educate adults. So if you do bike paths, it's not a waste of time. I mean, it's it, this is clean individual transport or clean public transportation is indispensable to divide the waste at home. It's not in our mind. Anything that is recyclable is part of our present and future. And this starts with simple habits to change, to separate organic from the inorganic, reuse, not waste, redistribute those small little habits with gender equality, with, with great vision. I think it's what can really transform us here and now as we definitely need. Muchas gracias. I think it, 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 covered, uh, it covered a lot in terms of what uh, uh, Mayor Lopez mentioned. I like the word magic and how, you know, <laughs> cities actually make it happen on the ground. How do you translate that passion and magic in terms of outcomes working with the youth and the different communities? Which brings me to the, to the same line of, uh, of question, uh, Mayor Gallego. What key mayoral powers like enabling or collaborating that we were talking about with local communities that you think really help drive a faster, bolder, and really a more transformative action? Again, addressing the different challenges that we are all facing right now. I am so excited to be here today with our announcement of 50 million green jobs. We may remember Buenos Aires forever for that important announcement. For me in Phoenix, we believe 300,000 of those green jobs will be in my community. And this will be a great opportunity for us to, to bring so many stakeholders together. Uh, in our community, the highest unemployment is among people who have been involved in our crim criminal justice system and people with disabilities. We can deliver green jobs for all of those individuals. Mm -hmm. I met a young man who had uh, been driving under the influence and been convicted of a felony, a very serious crime, at a very young age and struggled to go on and get good jobs, but then got a job working in greening spaces in Phoenix, in our parks department, a job with benefits, a union membership, and it was transforming. That's what green jobs can do for people in our communities. I met someone with autism who had also struggled to find employment but found that the circular economy was the perfect match for skills and motivation. So these green jobs make such a difference. Mm. If we get this 50 million jobs plan done, we will be able to achieve our 1.5 degree goal. And we will remember Buenos Aires as perhaps the most important initiative we've taken on for C40. So it's such an honor to be with you here today as we launch it. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that, that, that's, uh, that's really great in terms of, again, referencing the announcement and what it means in terms of green jobs, in terms of access, in terms of lower energy bills, uh, just across. And it's just great to, to hear you uh, say specific individual stories, the, the, the lives of, uh, of residents and what that means in terms of individuals and, and families, which... Uh, I know, Mayor O, you've been uh, waiting um, a, a while, but thank you for, uh, for uh, really staying with us. And I know that Seoul has done a lot, and uh, we, we've started talking about jobs. So maybe can you tell us from Seoul's experience why climate action really, and even progressing it and scaling it at this point in time, makes more sense in terms of addressing the citizens' needs. Can you speak to any wider benefits, as mentioned by um, uh, Mayor Gallego, in terms of jobs? and uh, other benefits as far as Seoul's work is concerned. So maybe uh, over to you in Seoul uh, now, Mayor O. C40 시장 여러분 반갑습니다. 아, 지난 2009년에 C40 시장 총회를 서울에서 개최한 이후에 
que va desde la pandemia del, del COVID-19 With the COVID-19 pandemic and the rising inflation, with the widening in inequality, the poverty, and the climate crisis, and in such difficult times, we tend to put less priority on climate change. I'd like to share with you some of the efforts that Seoul is making to tackle this climate change. For example, in the building retrofit project, which accounts for 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions, is a key task to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. This project may create many jobs in the short term and it has a great effect in reducing GHGs in the long term. Furthermore, this is very representative climate action because it reduces energy costs in addition to creating these actions and improving, of course, citizens' health uh, by creating more healthy households. Of course, we are also promoting the energy uh, and the building retrofit project reaching 280,000 by the end of uh, the set and established year. We have completed many projects of energy efficiency for 40,000 low-income households, which are highly vulnerable to the climate crisis, achieving a reduction in energy costs, as well as eliminating inequalities caused by climate change. In 2019, Greenhouse gas emissions uh, by domestic buildings reduced by 15 percent in comparison to 2005. This is a significant achievement taking into consideration the 15 percent increase in the total number of households in Seoul during the same period. terms of just sharing how um, Seoul's program is really targeted uh, for specific households. We've been hearing about, uh, you know, work of cities, work of mayors. So maybe, Steve, we'll turn over uh, to you in terms of the perspectives from communities, civil society. Can you tell us, and I know this is a big question, but succinctly, can you tell us what a fair and inclusive transition means to you, especially talking about, you know, green and just jobs, as well as just the overall in terms of benefits when we look at decarbonization or really the work in terms of addressing climate resilience as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. And really, I'm so appreciative of the space. Um, look, one thing we must agree on, climate change does not ignore the social challenges. It does not ignore the impact, nor does it ignore the outcome. So when we speak really about fair and just transition, we have to also speak about who are the agents of change. And relating to that, also, who are we leaving behind in the context of agents of change? The first thing we need to do, governments can't achieve this on their own. You need people, you need communities, you need knowledge production, you need education, you need awareness, but you need to ensure that the cities are inclusive. Do not leave women and girls behind. Do not leave LGBTI people behind. And also the idea of solidarity in addressing some of the social challenges, gender-based violence, poverty, and all these social issues, which actually contributes to the production of making sure that global climate change becomes a reality for all. Look, I think there's a notion where we always have to reflect about what does economy mean? What does climate change really mean? I mean, right now we're talking about 50 million jobs. It's a whole lot of jobs that we need to create. But what skills are required? And also, how are we going to apply equality for the decent jobs so that we don't only look at vulnerable and a marginalized population just 
as a back end that we are bringing in people at the last end. So there's no time for last tail. There's time for equality, there's time for equity, but also there is time for social justice change and climate change together, allowing that power of communities and power of people. What we also certainly know is that there's an urgency. We spoke about crisis. Our environment is facing what we call the struggle and sides of struggle for that is that we are not talking about how we move from the current context in many of our countries. I come from a developing country, so neither is the global north or global south are in the same lens. So we need to think about at what scale are we moving and what investment goes to it. But similarly, finances, let's put our money where our mouth is because you will be required as our mayors, as our leaders, to move from rhetoric to action. And moving from rhetoric to action means that you bring people along. That's what is meaningful for us. But civil society are key agents of change. They are, of course, one-time players that must have a seat on the table. The young people, the women, and all marginalized community to bring about the greenhouse and the green communities we want. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Steve. Very well said. I think uh, it, it redounds to uh, when we talk about cities, it's not just a city government, but we are all agents of change. I think that's, that's what uh, comes out there, and we all can contribute to that. Maybe quickly, uh, Mayor Gallego, I think it relates very much to, to my question to you. Um, Steve was talking about in her remarks about solidarity and really working together in collaboration. In your experience, what does it mean for you in terms of collaborating with civil society groups, with the youth? Um, with people with disabilities, whether organized or not. So maybe you can share um, briefly on that. We have tried in Phoenix to be as collaborative as we can and really do a wide variety of tools for outreach. Uh, when we yeah. worked on our climate action plan, we did it in more than one language. Uh, we've worked very closely with our trade unions because we want to make sure as we transition towards green jobs, we're investing in areas like electric vehicles and solar energy where people in our community want to work. Uh, government programs won't work unless both the private sector and our employees are excited about it. And we've found that those partnerships really help us be more successful. We want to move our economy as we green it. And so we hope we're creating the jobs of the future, but they have to be jobs that are young people want to work in. Yeah. Uh, we found that working with people who have returned from serving in our military and want to have a career change, energy efficiency is very excited. They are motivated by energy independence and not being dependent on sources of energy from foreign countries. It's a different motivation depending on what brings you to the table, but we seem to all have the same goal. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, in terms of, again, grounding what it means as far as your work with specific communities and people within, um, within Phoenix. I, I'm conscious of time, but I think we can extend just a bit more taking into account that Mayor O actually is, is staying on until midnight. And I think in his case, it's almost turning October 21 <laughs> while we sit here October, uh, October 20, uh, a bit ahead in Asia. So Mayor O, the theme of this conversation is clear at this point. It's really putting the people at the center of climate action. Which, which is really critical in terms of addressing uh, the various um, crises that we're facing. Can you tell us how Seoul creates enabling conditions for local communities to really meaningfully engage in climate action? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, words and for your consideration. I would like to particularly mention the fact that we are training uh, people 
uh, to obtain their degrees uh, and provide and for them to provide the necessary assistance to ensure energy efficiency in the different buildings of the city. In this way and through climate action, we can reduce the emission of GAGs and also create jobs for citizens. Uh, this also reduces energy costs for the most vulnerable groups. At the same time, this improves uh, residential areas and improves health of the citizens, and this in turn mitigates inequalities. As a result of this process, there have been several processes and policies addressing the climate crisis and to promote changes and in increase participation of citizens. This has become a top priority. Our city is promoting a program to incentivize citizens to save energy, of course, to save electricity, water, gas, and also to reduce the amount of waste they produce. Citizens can pay, for example, for expenses in their apartment buildings with their miles, and in turn, they can use that system to recharge their cards used for transportation. This, in turn, encourages the planting of trees and all goes towards a fund for energy well-being. So this fund allows uh, the city to uh, develop these different programs. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we had, a, we had a bit of an issue in terms of interpretation, but I think it's very clear in terms of, uh, of community. Maybe uh, just, just very quickly, and I would, uh, I would frame this to Steve and uh, uh, Mayor, Mayor Lopez. Um, in your case, Steve, just very quickly, we know that when we talk about community or even sections within, within community, you know, uh, youth, uh, um, people with disability, you also have to look at, at sort of like how, uh, what's the composition of the youth? It's not homogenous. Yes. And so just quickly, in terms of your perspective, um, how do you think cities can ensure that women, girls, and the LGBTQIA community have equitable access to what was being referenced as, you know, from the different mayors in terms of green jobs and opportunities or expanding meaningful, uh, sustainable livelihoods? Yeah. No, thank you so much. Look, one thing I can tell you, across the world, we still have over 70 countries that criminalize people because of who they are. And I want us to be honest. If we do not have the same equal rights, already climate justice is under threat. It threatens the idea of enjoying human rights that belongs to all of us just by virtue of being human. The right to life, the right to food security, decent jobs. So we must end stigma and discrimination for all for all without any kind of conditions because we are human beings. So I think we need to think about how we do so. So end criminalization and also end some of the injustices that exist. The injustices that also exist because of uh, uh, patriarchy uh, uh, that also, in, you know, we need to speak about that. But even the equal education opportunities, we have that responsibility. That responsibility to people to the environment for us to ensure sustainable life and sustainable green greenhouse. Thank you very much. And I know really, we're really at time, but maybe just the last word from you. Uh, Mayor Lopez, again, we're returning to Latin America after having heard from, America, uh, from the US, from uh, Korea, Asia, and then Africa. Just maybe very, very uh, few last words that you would want to send uh, to our audience and those that are watching us uh, live as well. I would just like to say, without the intention of causing division, of course, on the contrary, we, we must bring together our efforts. But I think that the hope of the world, practically in every aspect, is in the Global South. The Global South has, the, has a major opportunity. All of the cities that must be developed differently are in the Global South. The differences, the gaps that must be bridged, the inequalities that must be faced are in the, in the Global South. We have an opportunity today to do what the North, what it 
took the North centuries, and we can do it in a few years, and we can achieve this if we change education. Education is the key, and we have heard this in uh, youth representatives that spoke before me. The former uh, mayor of Bogota used to say that with education, we can achieve everything, with empathy, with collaboration, with sustainability, and which must be creative and fun also, like the kids in Bogota said. They want education to be fun and to be relevant as well. Secondly, with collective actions. I believe that, of course, sustainable development and economic development go hand in hand. They are not uh, opposed, but the order in which they take place does matter. So first of all, we need to care about people to protect people, and this includes non-discrimination, inclusion, and more opportunities, because it is these people with opportunities and with rights, they will be able to build the best collective action in human history, which is called democracy in order to create citizens with equal rights and equal obligations. And only democracies can protect the planet, protect peace, and engage in sustainability over time. Governments that do not even care for their own citizens will never be able to protect the citizens of other cities in other countries. So we must protect people to ensure that citizens protect democracies, and in turn, these democracies should care for the planet. Thank you much and I won't go into a, a summary of all that I know this is just the start and I hope the ideas the thoughts perspectives that were shared by our panelists is just um, an, a start in terms of deepening conversation in the next days but thank you so much uh, Mayor O, um, uh, Mayor Lopez, Mayor Gallego, Steve for showing us what city and community leadership is like. And just as a last note, I'll turn it over to Steve. The panelists, all of us agree that we do not end a plenary on uh, justice and equity sitting down. I think all of <laughs> us will need to stand up and really there's a need for a call of action. Steve, over to you. Thank you so much. Can we all stand up? Let's all stand up, and I want us to remember this because we're going to stand in solidarity. So Young much. people spoke, I think Hilda spoke in the beginning, and said, what do we want? Climate justice. And when do we want it? Now. now. What do we want? Climate, Climate justice. justice. When do we want it? Now. now. And because the theme of our summit is united in action. And if we move along like this together, collectively, and we will achieve this and we'll get a green, sustainable environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Gracias, Milak. Gracias a las alcaldesas y al alcalde. Thank you to the mayors. Thank you. Our next session will focus on the critical link between the climate crisis and public health, which the World Health Organization warns is humanity's most serious health threat. Leading Voices will explore effective solutions that protect and improve city resident health and well-being, while helping to transform cities into more livable and sustainable places. Our next speaker will be joining us virtually, so please welcome La Doctora Maria Neira, Director of the Department of Environment and Climate Change at the WHO. Muy, muy buenos días, Argentina from Geneva. Thank you very much for this incredible opportunity. I feel as well an enormous pressure and responsibility, the opportunity to talk to you and hopefully, hopefully influencing you on the way we will be promoting and protecting our citizens' health is incredible. 
I'm a doctor. I'm by training a medical doctor. So let me do what I know how to do best to be a doctor. And let me start therefore with the diagnosis. Yes, your cities are probably contributing on a very important percentage to the emissions of greenhouse gases. Yes, your cities are creating vulnerability now for humanitarian disasters. Yes, your cities will be at risk of having an increased number of uh, heat waves, putting your citizens at risk. Yeah, yes, your cities are as well suffocating with air pollution, most of your citizens around the world. With the pollution generated in the, in the cities, we are contributing to the 7 million premature deaths that are occurring every year in the world because of exposure to that air pollution. Yes, probably your cities are fully uh, making uh, the, the hospitals full of patients caused by exposure to air pollution, asthma cases, lung cancer, stroke, infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and of course, all of this is creating as well as inequity among your citizens. Now the good news, as a doctor, yes, we do the diagnosis, but we never stop there. We ask what next, what do we do now? So this is what I propose as a treatment plan. And I hope you will be very disciplined and you will follow this treatment plan. We count very much on you. So here are the prescriptions. And don't worry, I'm not asking you to lose weight or uh, stop drinking or stop smoking or anything like that. But maybe you should consider it as well. Here are my prescriptions. Please, every morning when you go to your office, make sure that you have among the, the date of uh, the, the day when uh, you have your newspapers and all the relevant information for the day, make sure that you have as well the possibility to monitor the quality of air in your city that day. Make sure that you know what are the, 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 uh, the criteria for measuring the, the air pollution in your city and make sure that you know what is the level of the day. Be very ambitious. Endorse WHO standards on air quality. That will require the minimum to protect the health of your patients. More you are ambitious, more lives you are protecting more cases of asthma you are preventing, more cases of lung cancer you are preventing. So I think that the, the mission is so fantastic and so extraordinary that it will be very good if you consider having an all your desk around the world, all mayors around the world, having the way to monitor the, the quality of air plus WHO standards to be implemented. Another prescription, Call on your doctors, call on the heads of the hospitals, call on your pediatricians, call on your respiratory specialists and ask them to help you to identify the messages around implementation of the measures you need to put in place to reduce air pollution, for instance. They will help you to quantify the health benefits that you are obtaining anytime you put in place a measure that maybe at the beginning might not be very popular for your citizens. If you use the health argument, I'm sure that everybody will react on a more positive way and moving and, and endorsing it strongly. So use your pediatrician. Call on the urban planners. They will help you as well to reduce the traffic in your cities. We need to stop giving subsidies to fossil fuels. The combustion of fossil fuels are literally, literally killing us. And I'm sure this is something that any mayor around the world will like to see in their city. So please promote a sustainable public transport, the one that will reduce our sedentary lifestyle. The sedentary lifestyle is killing us, is contributing to the non-communicable diseases. And the other way around, more you promote cycling and biking and the possibility of interact, more you are reducing diabetes, more you are reducing cardiovascular diseases, more you are reducing problems related to mental health. So the agenda of options, the positive outcomes is enormous. Of course, we want you as well to help us to increase the quality of the air we breathe, more energy efficiency in our buildings, and the way of making sure that your citizens will be better connected and will have the possibility of buying healthy food 
without spending a fortune to buy vegetables or fruits if they live in a, in a very crowded city. This is our diagnostic and our prescriptions. As you can see, nothing very complicated, but something that will have an incredible impact on the health of our people. If you implement those prescriptions, you will be safe. You will be saving the level of the, 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 the health of your population. You will be contributing to reduce climate change, the causes of climate change. You will be contributing to tackle the causes of air pollution. You will be contributing to the horrible agenda of obesity and sedentary lifestyle that is responsible for this epidemic of non-communicable diseases. You will be reducing as well the possibility of spreading virus and bacteria because the cities will be very well connected with less traffic, less overcrowded and with possibility of people uh, having better conditions for their life. You will be having such a rewarding uh, results that I'm sure that your citizens will vote you again. For sure, we will vote you if you implement all of this. Ambitious, but never is big enough when we are trying to protect the health of our citizens. Last point, um, this is our plan. So just to tell us how ambitious you are on the implementation and we can tell you how many lives you are saving. And I'm sure that you want to save as many as possible. We will be watching you. You know that after the prescriptions, the doctor will control from time to time whether you are following those recommendations. So we will be watching you, comparing you on a positive way, don't worry. But we want to measure the results in terms of health outcomes that you are generating thanks to the interventions that I'm sure you will be putting in place. Thank you very much. These prescriptions are for free. Don't worry, at the contrary, you will be generating more economy for your city, green jobs, and certainly a more sustainable, pleasant, healthy and well-being for everyone. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Dr. Neda, for your important remarks. Contributor to poor health outcomes is outdoor air pollution. Additionally, poor and marginalized populations tend to live near busy roads, industrial areas, and other sources of pollution. They have higher rates of pre-existing health conditions and lower access to health care. Together, these factors result in more suffering from pollution impacts. Our next panel will explore how cities are combining air quality management and climate action to both improve health outcomes and address the climate crisis. So please welcome to the stage our panelists, Daniel Quintero Calle, el alcalde de la ciudad de Medellín, Martina Otto, head secretariat climate and clean air coalition for the UN Environment Program, the mayor of Warsaw, Rafael Transkowski, and our moderator, Anta Williams, head of environment program at Bloomberg Philanthropies. Bienvenidos. We welcome you. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa. Thanks to all of you, and thanks to our panelists. My name is Antha Williams. I lead the environment programs at Bloomberg Philanthropies, which includes Mike Bloomberg's work to transition the world to clean sources of energy, promote sustainable cities, mobilize uh, finance for climate solutions, and protect and preserve the world's oceans. Um, but our mission at Bloomberg Philanthropies is to ensure better, longer lives for the greatest number of people. And in that context, air pollution, uh, and it, its connection to climate change are, are one of the, the um, solution and problem sets that are, are nearest and dearest to, um, to Mike Bloomberg's heart. He's also, as, as those who we work closely with know, uh, including mayors here and, and on the panel, um, he's a strong believer in data and the idea that you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, and the numbers on air pollution are quite clear. We've heard many of them 
today, but I think quite striking that the vast majority of, of residents of, of our cities are living in areas with pollution that far exceeds the World Health Organization guidelines. Um, but that there's also good news that we, we've heard that C40 cities have succeeded just in the last couple of years in cutting air pollution by 5%. So very good reasons for hope and um, very excited to, to dig into this, this discussion today. So let's get, let's get right into it. Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, dear, dear Mayor of, of Warsaw and close partner of ours. Um, you have done quite a lot and taken very strong action to tackle air pollution in the city of Warsaw and deliver for residents. So can you tell us a bit about why you've prioritized it, how you've done that, and, and what you've been up to? Hola, buenos dias. Hello, good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank Horacio Rodríguez Larreta for organizing this wonderful meeting. We have to speak in English. I'm sorry about that. So now I pass, I go on to English. I'm Mayor Warsaw, you know, everyone was telling me this is the most exciting job you can get. You know, you're going to focus on the future, build an innovative, dynamic city. And boom, six waves of COVID later, boom, a war in Ukraine later, boom, after an energy crisis, uh, later, we're here to actually uh, uh, face one of the biggest challenges that is before us. And before I tell you something about uh, pollution, I, I just wanted to send you the most important message, is that there are quite a lot of people, uh, my government, uh, with whom I have nothing in common, included, who say, you know, now's the moment to actually slow down. No, now's the moment to be even more ambitious. Because if we do not respond to this crisis by being ambitious, that's the on, end of the story, okay? And that's why we've undertaken so much and so many measures in, uh, in Warsaw in order to uh, fight climate change and, yes, improve air quality. Uh, we prioritize air quality because I think that this is uh, the easiest to explain to the people. And, of course, we have to carry the people with us. Uh, for the young generation, thanks God, climate change is not just a slogan. But for uh, my generation, who is uh, very well used to uh, their lifestyle, their cars, who are not that quick on moving ahead, uh, we need to increase the awareness. And people do understand what it means uh, to live in a city where the air quality is poor. That's why we've decided to concentrate, concentrate on that. And you've mentioned data, and this is uh, very important to us. That's why we are doing together in partnership the Breathe Warsaw program. We've decided, most importantly, to monitor the quality of air. Uh, and uh, we've decided to install 160 air quality sensors, uh, which is one of the most extensive networks uh, in Europe, in order to, first of all, demonstrate to the people what kind of quality of air uh, are they breathing, and in order to galvanize support for more ambitious actions. And of course, the most important one of them being uh, introducing uh, the zero emission zone by 24, 2024 in the center of Warsaw. But first of all, we need to carry the people with us, which is of course difficult in this crisis, in the energy crisis, with the uh, price of energy rising, uh, with inflation and so on and so forth. But this is our topmost priority, to make people, people aware, to carry them with us, and of course, uh, to prioritize public transportation, to uh, remove the coal power stoves and change them into heat pumps, which of course is not easy today, because we also need to make sure that people will not freeze to death. Uh, and guess what? The government in Poland, the conservative government in Poland, which wasted seven years, uh, now they're distributing coal subsidies. And they've asked us, the local mayors, to help them out. So my people, environment people, who are actually substituting uh, the uh, coal power stoves with heat pumps, now they're charged with distributing coal subsidies. But don't worry, we'll persevere, and most importantly, we'll make sure that this is just for this winter. Because if we really want to be serious about the quality of air, we need to think long term, and we need to be ambitious. Thank you so much for that. We'll, we'll come back to the set of challenges that you're facing this winter, but, but two quick points I want to draw out there. One is the importance of the connection between 
the solutions, the same solutions that solve air pollution that help tackle climate change. And, and for that, I want to I want to turn to you, um, Mayor of Medellin. Um, but the other is just the importance of monitoring the quality of the air, but also determining the sources of the pollution. So then you can design the policies and programs to tackle them. So really important points. So I'd like to ask you about Medellin has done incredible work and, and been a leader in Latin America. What has worked for you in connecting the air pollution work to your efforts on climate change? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Spanish uh, with your permission. I believe that one of the most important tasks that Medellin has done is to deploy a monitoring system, the most potent world in the country, in Latin America, I should say, creating and raising awareness in the citizenry in terms of the air they were breathing. In doing so, they acknowledged that 9% of the loss of lives that we had were owing to air pollution. And this has enabled us to create areas of protected air, let's say, and we had to take stronger, stringent measures like the forbiddance of buying and selling cars and go to gasoline. Tomorrow we will be signing in C40 that agreement. I'd like to tell you just a small story that I think is so relevant here. A few days back, I was in a stadium uh, that local stadium with over 50,000 people who were shouting, celebrating, they were very happy. But contrary to what you could expect, it was not of the National or Medellin local teams, fans, but thousands of children who for the first time got a computer. I mean, that image that became an icon in terms of that was uh, this child, Manuel, an 11-year-old, before realizing that he was being filmed right by local TVs, broadcasted, he, could, he would smell and kiss his computer, recognizing it as the opportunity he never had or his parents or his grandparents never had. But in addition, this also brought me into to my past, 30 years back when my mother also gave me for the very first time a computer. And this was a different Medellin. It was the most violent and aggressive city in the world. And our parents did everything possible so that we wouldn't go out of our home. There were 400, uh, let's say, murders in 100,000 inhabitants. So my mother died two years later without knowing that that computer would have changed my life. And I would have become, and I did become, an engineer, a business person. And one day I would be the mayor vis-a-vis uh, -vis thousands of young, like Manuel, delivering an opportunity to, to, to be concerned about their lives and to transform their lives to face climate change because while they were happy, I was concerned. And not because of the violence in Medellin. It's a different city today. One of the three best cities to visit, and Edinburgh is number one, and Chicago. But there are trains that connect north to south, a cable cable car cars that that really connect you to the most dangerous neighborhoods as well. But because we have acknowledged the reason why Medellin was the most violent in the world, it became so because it was, at the same time, the most unequal city in, in the world. So my concern, given Manuel and other children, the variables that made Medellin the most violent one are still there. They're waiting for us to make a mistake and we've already made that, that, that mistake, which is climate change. In the last three years, the rainfall has increased 40% in our city because of the increase in the planet temperature. The most impacted neighborhoods are the poorest, those who in, during the 90s meant violence in our cities rampant because of inequality. As a mayor of the city, as a leader, as an inhabitant of the second most biodiverse city in the planet, where 20% of birds variety live, where you have the majority of amphibians, of, of butterflies, of the fauna in the planet, I have moral authority to say, to ask to create a fund 
to help face cities and countries, the poorest cities and countries, because of the effects of climate change. The equation is very simple. Climate change will be equal to more inequality, and more inequality means violence. So we in Medellin, we don't want to go back to be that city, the most violent in the world, and we want to become, like now, the city of hope. But in doing so, we need, when we talk about global justice, for the cities, for countries, that we represent, which is only 0.05% of the emissions and the global emission stock, be supported by the majority of those responsible who for 200 years have contaminated our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mayor Quintero. This um, point about um, uh, combating new sources of instability feels like a very important one, particularly um, in light of the significant challenges that, that we're talking about with not just COVID, but rising inequality with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I, I do want to get to um, Martina Otto, um, the head of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, on the question of partnerships with national governments. It's come up yesterday. Mayor Lopez talked about it in the C40 Steering Committee in terms of places where cities are in a position to align better with their national governments. We've heard here about the incredible challenges of misalignment. Um, but your coalition was started with support from nation states. And so how do you think about the partnership on issues of climate and air quality? Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here um, at this important event. And indeed, the CCAC was founded by a club of six countries uh, and the UN Environment Programme based on a report that highlighted a couple of key measures that could be undertaken to address this deadly duo of climate change and air pollution. We've now grown to uh, 76 countries and 78 non-state actors, including C40 and some cities directly. And uh, in our work, we focus a lot on facilitating multi-level governance. And um, it is this cooperation between the level of governments that is needed. We have heard these encouraging examples of cities using their jurisdiction and their budget. It's showing results. And it gives a strong signal, but doing it alone faces limits. And we heard that already from, from, from Warsaw in the example. I wanted to give another one. Cities can buy buses for public transport that meet the latest emission standards to improve local air quality. And uh, if the fuel quality nationwide is not following suit, we do not harness the full benefits of these measures. So that shows very, very easily for everybody how intertwined this is. So what I'm getting at is policy coherence, mutually supporting measures to make cities' actions part and parcel of the delivery of nationwide commitments. And also using the cities actively as test beds, proof that measures can be done, looking at the cost, looking at the co-benefits that they generate, and then take it to the next scale with the nation governments. And I think there are four things that make a real difference in this. One is about national strategies that are inclusive, that are developed together with the um, local governments at all stages and not only as a once-off, but accompanied by mechanisms that do allow constant open channels and dialogue across ministries and across levels of government. The integration, and that's the third one, the integration across planning efforts. So if we look at nature-based solutions in cities, that has to be integrated in a bigger plan on infrastructure, because obviously there is also the allocation of budgets, and that's the fourth point that I want to get at, and that's finance that has to follow suit. So many of those investments that the cities are making will require national guarantees, the backing. So it's really important that one thing aligns with the other. The second is national urban policies should embed financing um, for uh, local government development uh, right, right from the start. And then the third is in this, in this finance package uh, to uh, access the 
international funding that is out there, often that is directly addressed to nation states, but how can we bring in local governments with the priorities so this is bottom up embedded in uh, the whatever is, is put forward as a project pipeline to these international finance mechanisms. So in sum, yesterday it was said it takes two to tango um, and we really need this whole of government approach uh, to make sure that we unleash this innovation capacity that we see in the cities um, and in this room um, and, uh, and really help with the scale up. So I think that's really the, the, the point that we have seen in our work, multi-level governments is critical. It's not always a given, it's not always straightforward and easy, but needs to be done. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mayor Shaskov, well say done. it for me. <laughs> say it for me. Shaskovsky. <laughs> All right, we've got it. Um, I, I want to turn to you on the, the challenges that you face this um, this winter. So coming out of the waves of Ukraine, the, the invasion of Ukraine, the waves of COVID before that, the challenges that your national government is piling on you. How are you thinking about delivering um, needs, especially for your most vulnerable residents this winter and balancing that with your long-term vision for what can happen? Well, the, the, the real problem is that, you know, we are that much dependent on the energy mix of uh, the country. Yeah. Uh, and of course, we are doing everything we can to make ourselves a bit independent by, for example, uh, investing in solar panels and so on and so forth. Uh, but we need to do that because, of course, we cannot allow people to freeze to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will do that. But the most important thing is that even if there are co-subsidies and we were delegate, you know, the task was delegated on us to make sure that this is just transitory and, and to keep on uh, realizing all of our priorities. And the most important thing is what Mayor of Medellin said, that all of those problems are interconnected. I'm just going to give you one example. Uh, we have one district of Warsaw which is underdeveloped. And on educational scores, it was always showing as the weakest. And we thought that it's because, you know, that people, the, the kids are not taken care of and so on and so forth. Once we started eliminating coal power stoves and actually connecting these apartments to central heating, educational scores went up because it turned out that those kids were simply cold and that they were missing school. So I think that we need to be ambitious. We need to realize our agenda because we are actually dealing with so many different challenges at the same time. And even in this difficult day and age when there is an energy crisis and where you know, people will start paying the price of the war, uh, that Russia has waged on Ukraine, that's, you know, there is even a bigger need for us to take responsibility and, and to look into the future. And of course, think about today, but also think about tomorrow. Incredible. Um, well, thank you for those comments. Um, I'd like to turn for the final word to uh, Mayor Quintero. Well. Um, Mayor Quintero, you, we're, we're holding the summit here in Latin America, and um, you have uh, shown a lot of uh, leadership in these areas. What do you think is unique that we should all be thinking about in terms of the opportunities and challenges in this region in particular? Well, I think uh, one of the challenges Latin America have right now and, and an opportunity at the same time is integration. I'm going to move again to Spanish, sorry. La <laughs> integración. Uh, Integration in Latin America constitutes a major opportunity in terms of climate change. If, for example, we interconnect the electrical grid of Latin America, we will achieve a significant reduction. And uh, if there's a bad mix in the energy matrix, uh, it is not possible to ensure the stability uh, overall. So if we interconnect, which we haven't been able to do so far, then that will distribute the risks of lack of supply of energy in general. So, uh, for example, this will also reduce carbon emissions that are associated with energy in the countries. There is another major threat that I would like to present here, and it's the fact that as other regions start forbidding the use of gas-powered uh, cars, it is very likely that, as it has happened in the past, those industries that burn coal will try to find shelter in Latin America. So that's a big threat. And that is a reason, even going against many unions of the car industry and car dealers in the countries, it led us to 
forbid the use of gas-powered cars as of 2035 in our cities. And this is a very clear message that we want to convey, and it should be replicated in different cities of Latin America. This will not be the city where we accept contaminating industries. We can and will be a wonderful continent with clean air and with great capacity for tourism, but we need to focus on protecting air and the environment. Thank you so much. Please join me in giving a, a, a final round of applause to our panelists. Thank you for your comments and all your work. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Anta, and thank you to our panelists for such a dynamic conversation. It has become clear that the solution for air pollution, climate crisis, and public health go hand in hand. Let us now talk about how there are initiatives around the world with an incredible and powerful impact. Let's start by focusing on the impacts on public health. Our next Spotlight On will be in Paris and France. Paris has become a pioneer in the concept of the 15-minute city. Let's welcome our next speaker, former C40 chair and mayor of Paris, Madame Anne Hidalgo. Welcome, mayor. Dear friends, dear mayors, colleagues, friends of mayors as well. I am delighted to be here in this beautiful city. I would like to, of course, thank our friend, the mayor of Buenos Aires, Horacio, for receiving us with uh, such hospitality and friendship in this uh, beautiful city. Also, I would like to thank the chair of the C40 also for his leadership in the work that he is carrying out from our organization. Of course, our friend, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. We are gathered here today to work and to exchange on the different practices. In Paris, one of the practices that we've engaged in is something that we've seen also in other cities where something that all mayors in the world are trying to do, which is to try to have cleaner air, to have fewer uh, casualties, fewer diseases in general, and to make public transportation a priority. Also, to prioritize the use of bicycles. For me, the model has been Copenhagen and Amsterdam. And today, I think we can say that we are in a city that is moving forward, and Paris has shown that it can be an old city that preserves its architectural heritage, but which in turn can bring forward these changes. And we have seen this in the youth population, in women, in and non-conservative people in general are really uh, supporting these policies. Something that we will describe as well is the 15-minute city and what that means exactly and why 15 minutes. Because we are the mayors of really large cities. And why are we there? Because we know, we know full well that in order to really tackle this challenge of climate change, we need to do it together with the citizens and with the young population, because they want to not only participate, but also decide. In Paris, we have opened the Climate Academy, which is also a response uh, to the demands of the youth. We are telling them that this is a place where you can learn and where the generation of your parents and of your grandparents can also learn. 
And only together in forums and places like this, where we have the 15-minute program, but also in the Climate Academy, we will be working together on a new narrative. This narrative reflects this dream that we must develop with optimism. When we do so, there are clear results. And when we do this, we envision it as something that takes place in the entire world, in all cities, by ensuring more peace. The mayor of Medellin just said this. We are offering cleaner air, fewer cars, more nature, and we try to offer opportunities to the middle class by maintaining these projects in our cities. Of course, the resources are not the same everywhere in the world, but by maintaining a high level of education, of health care services, and fighting against inequality, because, of course, inequality can be one of the worst consequences of climate change. And in this way, we are offering social housing. We are offering safe and democratic spaces for dialogue in order to promote and encourage citizens' participation. The goal is to make the future of youth and the protection of the elderly the priorities and topics that are dealt with at the level of the city, but also from the perspective of the 15-minute cities, because we are there not only on social media, but with our presence. And how wonderful to be here, really, to really become submerged in so many positive projects and ideas. These are optimistic projects that are part of what we do in our cities every day to improve the lives of citizens. Dear friends, we are already fully aware of these topics, and mayors have a gigantic responsibility on our shoulders, even more so in times of crisis. When there is a war that breaks out overnight, such as it happened on February 24th in the Ukraine, who was in the front line? Mayors. Organizing what? The resistance, but also the evacuation of children, of women, of the elderly, of families, and the lives that needed to be reorganized in times of war. So the value and the strength of seeing our colleague in Kiev, whom I was able to visit on April 13th, he was so brave, together with all of the other mayors who were also so brave in cities of the Ukraine which, are, which have been destroyed. And the question was how to build a, a rebuild the city for tomorrow so that life can be safer for them. Together with all of these mayors, of course, we admire their work. And I would also like to point out the hard work of our friends in Africa, Armand, the mayor of Guadagudu in Burkina Faso. We haven't heard from him since the last coup in that country. But when we spoke before, he talked to me about his efforts to fight against climate change, to promote the development of youth, and to improve the quality of life of the population. And also the work of another mayor called Adama. Adama is the mayor of Bamako. And still today, he is trying as much as he can, and with incredible efforts, he is trying to help the population with all of the risks that surround him. The amount of strength and responsibility that he has, because in the face of the lack of response, and of course this in the context of coup, of terrorism, of wars, and the impossibility of living in several areas, together with immigration, climate refugees, and other problems, of course, the responsibility and the strength has a lot to do because in the face of the lack of response in the face of climate change, 
at in the times of Donald Trump, for example, when the mayors and the governors of North America organized together with Mike Bloomberg, who I would like to uh, say hi from this podium. And at the time, they organized together with the United Nations, with the Secretary General, they organized the resistance. They organized a response a response from the mayors in the face of climate change. We have also had within international organizations people like Angel Guria who have helped us a great deal and who has received the support of mayors who were involved in inclusive uh, projects and who was very committed to the issue of climate change. When states fail to act, mayors resort to a demand for climate justice. Of course, the youth has the youth have mentioned this topic, and when it comes to climate justice, we must ensure an international law that ha that can become a reference. For example, in my city, in Paris, and in other European cities as well, uh, Madrid, for example, or Brussels, we organized an action at a European level at the uh, European Court of Justice to have the right to develop policies in our cities to ensure less contamination, which means, of course, less cars, fewer cars, and fewer cars with fossil fuels. Another topic that both mayors and NGOs are developing at an international level uh, and within the context of climate justice is to confront an international company called Total an action developed by Paris, New York, and other NGOs in this process to fight against climate injustice and the mayors. The mayors who are here, who are in this world, which is in the midst of a crisis. And we are always fighting peacefully. One of our main characteristics is that we engage in peaceful actions. We are not fighting with violence. We actually fight against violence. And we try to develop policies together with citizens. And these policies should be at the level of their lives to improve their quality of life. And we try to do so in a peaceful way. We already know that lack of action has a very high price. We also know, together with all the mayors who are gathered here today, and I know it because I am the mayor of Paris, we know that action against inequality is possible. Action against climate change is possible. And also, we can act democratically together with citizens. Of course, when these actions take place, the results improve the lives of people. We know it. There is no impossibility. So what should we do more and what must we do more and what can we do? This is what we are all thinking. Somebody quoted Benjamin Franklin before. and. I would like to mention Martin Luther King, another uh, major figure of the United States who said, we either live as brothers or we die as idiots. Of course, this is a very strong statement. But Dr. Luther King also said that those who prefer peace should become organized and we should organize in the same way as those who choose war. So I think that's what we need to do even more. We need to organize ourselves, such as this meeting, the C40. We should organize with other networks of mayors and also with those who are not mayors, but who know that the future of the planet and the future of humanity 
and even the future of the economy, the future of employment, all of this comes together within this opportunity in this fight against climate change. All of those who are grabbing onto those fossil fuels, who are running out and are killing so many people and are resulting in so many wars, well, this is going to end. And it is a good thing that there are economic leaders in the world who know that the future of tomorrow must involve a world where a lot of efforts need to be invested in the development of renewable energies and to develop methods that involve technology, but also democracy, something that is essential for this new world that we must envision and construct together. Organizing also means to continue acting and developing new ideas. The 15-minute city idea is also essential because it speaks about the importance of being together as brothers and sisters, not thinking that some people have the solution and others have a good life or a bad life. No, we have to think of a more democratic system, a stronger system where there are human decisions. And when decisions are made by humans, they need to take place at the level where life happens, where life is organized. And that's why the 15-minute city concept is so essential. It's not a gadget. It's a different way to live and experience these changes and also of becoming involved in the changes and in the solutions. We also need to continue speaking to one another if we think about the potential that exists here in this group that we've put together with the C40 and other networks of mayors, thinking about other cities and other leaders, the foundations that are here and which support us, the potential is really huge. So why don't people listen to us more? Why aren't we seeing more results? not necessarily in our cities, because we do have results in our cities. And we also have the scientists, scientists who are here supporting our message and saying they have been doing what we told them to do for 40 years. And what we had predicted 40 years ago is actually happening uh, in, in terms of climate change. So, why doesn't this group, which is so big and so diverse, why doesn't it have more strength, more potential, and eventually more power? We do have the support of international organizations. Why? Because we need to organize more strongly in the face of lobbies. We talked about oil companies. We mentioned gas companies, and we already know who has been fighting against our ideas. We know who has been fighting against our projects in the cities, and it is the lobbies. In 2014, when I was first elected as a mayor, I started speaking about these changes in the city, and I was talking about fewer cars, and there was a uh, huge bashing of that idea. And when you look at this closer, at the level of the 15-minute cities, when I spoke to the citizens, to the women, the people who are working and who are actually living in their own century, they told me, keep going, Mayor. Come on, do not let them intimidate you. Do not let them intimidate you with their reaction. And it was the lobbies that were reacting. So we must organize maybe more professionally or more efficiently in the face of these reactions. We must also continue to receive these recognitions and cooperating with international organizations. This is absolutely essential if we want to be more efficient.
we must also act at an international level. Because I think that when we think about the international level and the local level, they seem distant, but I think they need to come closer together. They need to act as partners and work together. Because at these two levels, we already know how to fight the lobbies and how to organize a response where the citizens support us. Why? Because when the results are there, life improves. With less contamination, with less pollution, life is better. Our friend Eric Garcetti showed this, and we can prove this, of course, uh, that this is a reality in Paris and other cities as well. We need to work together on the topic of international climate justice. I believe that the mayor's organization need to tackle the issue of climate justice. And at an international level, this means that we need to have an international court, which should be the reference or the court of reference when a problem arises. Maybe a problem that involves a highly contaminating industry or it involves the lack of action of a certain country. There should be a place, a forum, where we can establish the rights for humanity, a right for biodiversity, the rights of nature. I think that this could become uh, 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 an interesting topic. I think with the 15-minute city concept and also the relationship with international organizations, I think that it can make us stronger in this fight because we are a majority. Those who want business as usual is the minority, and we are the majority, those who want this change. So we need to continue moving forward. And the idea of having a court such as we have the, uh, the criminal court, International Criminal Court for war crimes or crimes against humanity, there should be a court that deals with crimes against nature and crimes against biodiversity. I believe that this is a topic that we should tackle together. We must also become organized in terms of something that sometimes uh, causes many difficulties. And it is something that is happening everywhere, social media. Social media constitute great opportunities, but also are platforms that promote hate, lies, fake news. And I know that Professor Moreno is a victim of constant attacks on social media because he is speaking about climate change and 15-minute cities. All of this is weakening democracies. And we shouldn't be naive about this. We need to build a more methodic and uh, efficient uh, system and continue working on these topics because these types of attacks affect and weaken and undermine our democracies. So mayors should continue working on this and organizing better so that we can put an end to the use of fossil fuels and promote equality, education, offer better opportunities, better health care, and listen to the young population by creating a new narrative and ensuring that there are new dreams for the future. This must involve the strengthening of communities and must foster participation so that we can fight against lobbyists and act, really act against their interests. These interests want things to continue as they are. So that we are the ones who are the only ones promoting change. So, dear friends, it is a great pleasure to be here in Buenos Aires to foster this new world. Thank you.
Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Mayor Ana Hidalgo, she is an example of how working in locally we can really move forward effectively and even more than in the federal space. From Qin Jae Son, he's the mayor of Shenzhen, China, and the mayor Eric Adams of New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, greetings to you all. I am the mayor of Shenzhen, China. I am very pleased to share my views on green transport in Shenzhen. The earth is the home to us all. Climate change is a challenge facing all of humanity, which requires our joint actions. Shenzhen is a mega city with over 20 million people and 3 trillion renminbi of economic aggregate. As a C40 member, we are committed to ecology first and green development. We are in full gear for the transition to green and low carbon transport and to provide the Shenzhen solution for cities around the world. We are improving our green transport network. We're focused on building a green, low carbon, convenient and comfortable public transport system, connecting rail, bus and non-motorized traffic networks. As of 2021, Shenzhen has at least one bus stop in place within a radius of 500 meters. By the end of this year, the operating mileage of urban rail transit will exceed 500 kilometers with over 3,000 kilometers of non-motorized vehicles, lanes and 3,100 kilometers of urban greenways. We promote new energy vehicles, NEVs. We are among the cities that host the largest number of NEVs globally, and we are also the world's first city to realize full electrification of buses. Shenzhen's Bus Full Electrification Program received the Outstanding Achievement Award at the 63rd UITP World Public Transport Summit. By the end of of August, we cities, the city's ownership of NEVs reached 666,000 units, which is expected to exceed 1 million. So from January to August, the penetration rate of NEVs in Shenzhen reached 52.9%. So over 1.3 million metric tons of carbon emissions are reduced annually. In the same period, the city's PM 2.5 concentration registered 14 MCG per cubic meter, the lowest among Chinese megacities. We champion green travel. Shenzhen has promoted Green Travel Month and Public Transport Week, improving the service quality of public transport, safeguarding the public transport rights of people with disabilities, building then in a carbon inclusion mechanism, enhancing the public sense of gain with green travel. In 2021, public transport and green transport took up 57 percent and 73.8 percent respectively of rush hour traffic. Green travel has become the first choice for our citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, green, friends, green, low carbon and sustainable development in transport is vital to the world's green economic recovery and res response to climate change. We will take the summit as an opportunity to promote exchanges and cooperation move towards carbon peak and carbon neutrality, improve public health and well-being, and join in global actions to tackle climate change. Thank you. Hi, I am New York City Mayor Eric Adams. Thank you to C40. London Mayor Sadiq Khan and Buenos Aires Mayor Horatio Rodriguez Loretta for inviting me to speak today. And thank you to my fellow mayors from around the world who are doing so much to low emission and build resiliency, not just in the future, but right now. 55% of the world's population is already living in urban areas, a proportion that is expected to increase to 68% by 2050. And the decisions our municipal governments are making are opening the green door to a world of abundance and equality. That's the world I want to talk to you about today. This is a world where clean energy costs less 
and helps our kids breathe easier. A world with more transit options and safer streets. A world where people are eating healthier, feeling better, and living longer. That's the world we are building right here in New York City. Let's start with the facts and the food. Thanks to our public transit system and our density, New Yorkers already emit fewer carbon emissions per person than virtually any other city in America. But when we dug into the data, we found that food is among the largest sources of our household and lifestyle emissions in the city, and one that is easy to control and change. I know because I've made those changes in my own life. One morning in 2016, I woke up and couldn't see the numbers on my alarm clock. I went to the doctor who diagnosed me with type 2 diabetes. He told me I might have my driver's license revoked due to vision loss, and I might have permanent nerve damage in my fingers and toes. I'm not the only person who has had this conversation with their doctor. More than 37 million Americans have diabetes. Over one in 10 of us, 37 million, when a number is that high, you can't blame it on the individual. A number that high means there's something wrong with the system. And when I looked at our food system, I saw that it wasn't just unhealthy, it was unsustainable. Americans are suffering from skyrocketing levels of obesity and chronic diseases, and nearly one in five of our children are already overweight, putting them at risk of lifelong health issues. The American way of eating today is focused on profit, not progress, on empty calories and fast food, not on health. We can't live like this. The human body was built to run on plants, not processed food. And the planet was built that way too. Almost half the fresh water used in the United States goes towards raising animals for food. One calorie from animal protein requires 11 times as much fossil fuel energy to produce as a calorie of plant protein. 30% of the world's land mass is devoted to raising animals for slaughter. Reducing meat and dairy consumption in favor of fresh produce and grains isn't just about improving your own life and your own health. It's about transforming an entire system that exploits our natural resources, drives up our carbon emissions, and incentivizes poor nutrition. And it all starts with what's on our plates. When I switched to a plant-based diet, I saw an immediate difference in my health. Within three months, I lost weight, lowered my cholesterol, restored my vision, and reversed my diabetes. But when those changes are scaled up across the city, they are not just creating better health, but lowering our emissions and improving our lives. As mayor of America's largest city, my job is to lead the way on these kinds of big systemic transformations. Our city is taking action to make food that is good for our people and good for the planet available to all. We have already introduced meatless Mondays and plant-powered Fridays in schools and made plant-forward meals the default in New York City health and hospital facilities. Making the right choice easier has been a great success. The majority, 60% of our hospital patients are already choosing plant-based meals. And these changes didn't just improve health outcomes. They lowered the carbon emission of the food we purchased as a city by 37%. We're making choices like this all over the city, from serving plant-based menus at official mayoral events to supporting and emerging urban agriculture industry that includes locally grown produce, grains, and beans. And we're not just growing tomatoes, we're growing the economy. Urban agriculture is creating jobs and building resiliency at the same time we're increasing access to healthy food and reducing emissions from the transportation of our food. From rooftops to classrooms, I have supported the funding of urban agriculture, education, training, and businesses. We established the city's first ever office of urban agriculture, and we're working with our private sector partners to reduce waste, lower emissions, 
and increase sustainability. And we're doing all of this even as we promote new ways of building, living, and generating energy. New ways of protecting our city from rising seas and stronger storms. New York City has never been afraid of trying something new, and that is more important than ever. Fighting climate change isn't about trying to keep everything the same, and it's not about giving up our way of life. It's about transforming it. It's about making everything better and creating momentum for a new and innovative way of living and eating. Changes in the air and on the menu. Today is just the appetizer. Thank you so much to Mayor Adams, leading by example. Qué emocionante escuchar mensajes así. It's so nice to listen to messages like that. Thanks to Mayor Chin. And if you're enjoying learning about what the city of Shenzhen is doing, please visit c40summit.org slash news to read about other transformative projects from c 40 Chinese cities. Our next conversation will focus on food systems and their connections with city climate resilience. Food is a significant contributor to the global climate crisis. One third of all food is wasted, yet many around our planet suffer from food insecurity, which has been exacerbated due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But 70% of the world's food is consumed in urban centers, giving cities the power to deliver transformative change. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our panelists. Herman Marti Tegui, chef and owner of the renowned vegetarian restaurant Marti in Buenos Aires, Youth Climate Leader Marie Chouraud, and our moderator, Kaisi Suderland, Managing Director of Climate Solutions and Networks at C40. Bienvenidos. Bienvenidos. We welcome you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And uh, I'm going to open this panel by starting with an apology that we're about to have 10 minutes incredibly fascinating inter uh, conversation all about food and you haven't had your lunch yet. So I can only apologize, but this is gonna really whet the appetite for the rest of the session. So let me introduce my, uh, my stellar conversation partners today. So we have uh, Marie Chouraud, uh, who is a French climate activist, got involved in the Fridays for Future and Youth for Climate France movement right from their beginnings in 2018. I'm not gonna reveal your age because you're only 16 then, Marie, so uh, <laughs> delighted to have you join us. And also Herman Matte, who is one of Argentina's most prolific fine dining chefs and has opened a vegetarian restaurant right here in Buenos Aires. So, no more from me. Over to you two. Let's have a start. And Marie, I'll ask you to open for us. What does healthy and sustainable eating mean to you? And what are you really doing to make it a reality? Well, I think um, there are two meanings in terms of um, a healthy food. Um, there is the meaning which um, there is a, 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 the food, the healthy food for humans, um, which is uh, for me a balanced food and uh, also maybe uh, some organic food which have um, no product who are bad for the human body. But there is also um, a, a global meaning, and uh, also um, I, I would say we can we can talk about healthy food for the planet. Um, we know that some uh, products are very bad for the planet, and the consuming of, uh, for example, meat is not really good for um, the planet, so maybe um, uh, a healthy um, food for the planet would be um, vegetarian uh, or plant-based um, uh, food. So uh, I am trying to raise awareness on this topic to explain also what, what are the impacts of, um, of the food in our societies and how we can cook differently, maybe the chef uh, will explain this later, but yeah, how we can um, cook differently and how we can um, yeah, create delicious meals, meals without um, a meat. And also maybe, for example, a concrete action. 
Um, I'm from Paris in France, and um, in Paris we recover um, unsold products and we cook them for the homeless people. And I think it's a global action because we fight against food waste and we also provide an access to sustainable um, and balanced food uh, for all the people. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Marie. And I think this uh, healthy food for people and planet is a perfect way of putting it. I think it's really clear. So, Herman, to share some recipes with us or just give us your thoughts on uh, what does healthy and sustainable eating mean to you? Okay. Health uh, is, a, is a very uh, wide uh, topic. Uh, I think that uh, food could be, if you, were, if you were living in the wild, food could be a po poison. And, and food could be a medicine, and uh, that was before. Now you need like uh, knowledge, you need will, uh, and, and and you need flavor and you need taste. So uh, take, taking all this in consideration, knowledge to know what is good for you. Of course, you have to eat fresh. You have to eat seasonal. You have to eat uh, vegetables, seventy percent. We have to renounce to this diet of rich animal uh, protein. Uh, that, that's a fact. And, and when you say this, and will, because you, are, you have this challenge. Every time you go to a supermarket, you, you receive all this, all this, all this uh, 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 messages from marketing saying you have to eat this, you have to eat that. So uh, I will go back to education. You, you can go, we can get to healthy food through education. You can, we can do it in schools. You can educate people in school. Uh, but we, we also have to, we don't have, because uh, the, the, the guys, the, the children are going to school now, they will be grown ups in 20 or 30 years. And, and everybody is telling, okay, you have to take action now. And this, this is what we have, we have to do. We have to tell the parents now what the children has to eat. And, and of course, they will go back from school. If, they, if, they, if the children receive the, the correct information, they, go, they will go back to their parents to teach them. And I see this all the time. Uh, I, I see children teaching their parents to recycle or telling their grandparents, OK, no, that, 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 that plastic bottle will go to that side or that side. You don't have to eat this or eat that. So it's a, I, I think it's a lot of, and of course I'm living in, in a country with 50% of poverty, 50% of our population lives under, under the line of poverty, and we have to address all these problems at the same time. I mean, we don't have time to address one problem and, and, and then the, 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 the next problem. So maybe, so, Herman, you could, yeah. you could tell us particularly about why you opened a vegetarian restaurant recently in Buenos Aires and, and what the kind of feedback has been from uh, <laughs> customers and uh, particularly Argentinians. So, yeah, of course, the, the pandemic was a, a big catalyst of ideas. And you, actually, you didn't know if the world was going to end or not. So I, I promised myself, uh, I, I just became a parent, like uh, I have... Uh, two, four years old children. And I look at them and I say, okay, if, if, if we pass through this, I will, I will do something. I will take action. I will, I will do what I have to do. And even I, when I am like a re relatively su successful chef here in Argentina, I decided to, to become vegetarian. I closed my other restaurant, Tegi, and I opened Marty, uh, taking in consideration, which seems that because chefs today, we have like a lot on our shoulders, I think. You are responsible for the health of your customers. You are re responsible for uh, sharing equality in your, with your uh, workers. Um, you have to pay fairly to the people that produce the, the food. And, and you have to m transmit a message. So I say, okay, I will do it very shortly. I will open a new restaurant. Uh, with a kitchen I call transparent, not open, because you can see everything we are doing. And, and we know each one of our producers by name, by last name. We know where they live. We know 
how, the, how we pay them. And of course, I, I know that I live in Argentina. Uh, beef is a very big, we are proud of our beef. It's part of our, uh, it's part of our culture, it's par part of our heritage, and it, it will be very difficult. I was, I was, I'm speaking too much. You're okay, you're okay. okay. You can, uh, we'll give Marie a chance okay. to interject yeah. in a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's important. I, I really liked her man that you, um, you know, particularly mentioned being inspired by becoming a parent and everything. And, you know, this takes me on, Marie, to the particularly you're involved closely in the Fridays for Future movement. And I know we have a, a very important climate march here in Buenos Aires tomorrow and food is going to feature. Can you talk to me about, you know, why is, is food and sustainable food and cutting emissions from food so important to our youth activists? Um. Yeah, so tomorrow um, there will be a march in Buenos Aires um, and so um, this mobilization is also to encourage uh, cities to be more sustainable and uh, especially demand to um, support the declaration of the C40 about sustainable food and especially the, about um, uh, plant-based food. and. Um, on this topic, I would like to, to congratulate the mayor of New York who decided to uh, bring uh, plant-based food in his canteen um, in the school. And I think it's, it's a really great decision um, because we know that meat consumption um, could uh, have a big um, impact on CO2 emissions. And also, I would say it's um, a public health issue because we know that excessive consumption of meat causes um, co uh, some uh, disease like cancer. So fighting for um, healthy food and fighting for plant-based plant uh, food uh, benefits for, for the human and for the planet, as I said before, so that's very, very, very good. But I think we can go further and um, I would like to to, to, to say to the mayors that um, they have the power to, um, to since they provide food in the, the school canteens, so they, they can get, go further um, in the choice of food, and they also they can buy um, from farms that don't use pesticides or don't use GMOs, um, which are very bad for humans and for the planet. And so I think it would be a strong symbol um, uh, to support planet-friendly um, uh, planet farming mode, uh, which is not the case of the government uh, uh, at this moment. So it would be, it would be great to, to support this kind of agriculture. And, um, and yeah, so please consider it. <laughs> Fantastic. We love a call to action at the C40 World Mayor's Summit, Marie. So we're delighted that that call for cities to really lead by using their procurement power and to really push forward regenerative agriculture much more strongly. And in our closing moments, uh, Roman, any, any particular asks or, or thoughts of what you think mayors and cities should be doing? Yeah, I will talk. Uh, uh, I think my country will have it very difficult. Uh, because of, uh, I say beef is part of our culture, culture. I was listening to the LA mayor that said they, they are like uh, going from oil to, to clean energy and they are taking their, their time. I think that we, we and uh, many other countries, they, they, we will have to do it slowly. Even if I, I, I can do it fast because I can change my restaurant to vegetarian, just like that. Uh, the, the country will need to replace the shops to replace the exports but we have to do it, somebody has to say it, the future is uh, plant-based, for, for sure. Great, so really using the leadership of our cities. Yeah. So, I want to say a huge thanks to my <laughs> panel. I really enjoyed this conversation. We've already had an invite from her man to his restaurant, so uh, we're looking everybody. forward to meeting up again uh, at Marti sometime soon. And a uh, big thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you very much. Very good. The future is plant-based. I love that. Thank you so much. Our final spotlight on segment of the morning is coming from my hometown, from Miami. 
So please welcome to the stage Mayor of Miami, Mr. Francis Suarez, who will talk about the connections between public health and resilience. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Great to be here. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure and a privilege being with you all. My colleagues, mayors, elected officials, I believe that he also the county mayor, of course, of my county, is probably here. Could you please stand up? Here you are. Here she is. So a round of applause to her. She really deserves it. And the rest of the dignitaries who are here with us, it is a pleasure being here with you all together to talk about one of the most important subjects in our era. My name is Francis Suarez. I am the Miami mayor and president and the chair of the U.S. National Mayors Conference. For those of you who are not familiar uh, with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, we are a nonpartisan organization representing 1,400 of the nation's largest cities. In the United States, you won't be surprised to know that mayors are leading the charge against the climate crisis. We have long been key innovators and the driving force for real solutions that are making our cities more energy efficient and more resilient. For mayors, climate is not political. There is no such thing as a Republican or Democrat hurricane, flood, or excessive heat wave. More than any other level of government, we are the cornerstone of the country's successful efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Mayors don't have the option to look the other way or to play politics with this issue. Climate change is not theoretical for us in Miami. It's real. Not only do we face hurricanes that are increasing in magnitude, we just saw a devastating hurricane Ian on the Gulf Coast of Florida that produced 15 foot or more of storm surge, but we're also facing even flooding on sunny days, higher temperatures, and rising sea levels that most have predicted will be devastating for our city. I was honored to say hello to the mayor of Rotterdam uh, before I came up, who's doing phenomenal things to make Rotterdam more resilient, and uh, we'll continue to collaborate with cities across the world. In Miami, our community is coming together to tackle these challenges and the threats that they pose to our health and the well-being of our residents, from clean air and safe drinking water to sufficient food and secure shelter. We have passed the Miami Forever Bond, which will invest $400 million in five key categories, which align with the city's most pressing needs, from clean air and safe drinking water to sea level rise and flood prevention, roadways and parks and cultural facilities, public safety and affordable housing. There's no doubt that the climate crisis is creating a cascade of health problems, particularly for our most vulnerable residents. The extreme heat is making the air quality poor, trigger, triggering a longer allergy season and exacerbating asthma-related illness. Heat-related illnesses are increasing at our local hospitals, both from people who don't have access to air conditioning and those who come to visit to have a good time enjoying our beautiful city. Everything that we build affects our health. In Miami, for instance, we are designing building codes to withstand hurricane force winds. We're expanding light rail in the downtown area to get people out of their cars and we are offering a free trolley service and updating our bicycle master plan to reduce greenhouse gas effects. 
We've also created a new drainage system through a comprehensive stormwater master plan. This will not only protect us from flooding and sea level rise, but it will also prevent the pooling of water, which is a breeding ground of mosquito-borne diseases. Nearly 200 million of the 400 have been allocated from the Miami Forever Bond for these important stormwater projects that increase quality of life, not only for our residents, but also for our visitors. That's some of the story of leadership in the city of Miami. But I'm also glad to be here with some of my fellow American mayors who are tackling this issue in their own way locally. Nowhere in the United States is action more real than at the local level. And each of these mayors has a story to tell about how they're making our cities more resilient and what they're doing to lower our carbon output. Last year, we surveyed more than 100 mayors about approaches they're taking to fight climate change. The top solution was electrification of our transportation system. American cities are investing heavily in electric vehicle infrastructure that will enable rapid adoption of these cars as well as the transition of mass transit to electrification. We're working to put EV chargers in our neighborhood parks and in parking garages that are heavily used near our Biscayne Bay to start this important transition. Mayors are also prioritizing greener buildings with LED lighting and lower energy outputs. In Miami, we replaced over 25,000 of our street lights with LED bulbs, reducing emissions and at the same time increasing public safety. Another major component is solar. Cities are increasingly making investments to power their state their communities with renewable energy and solar is the source most on the minds of mayors. In my home state, Florida Power and Light just announced their Real Zero plan. Our major, major purveyor of en energy announced their Real Zero plan. They are planning to eliminate all carbon emissions in operations by 2045. And they are doing this by moving away from natural gas, and towards solar and green hydrogen. We want to talk to you about what we're doing in American cities, as well as hear about the work being done by mayors around the world, which is why it's so important for us to be here, for us to pledge the real concrete action that we're going to take to achieve carbon neutrality or carbon positivity in our world. Muchísimas gracias por... Thank you so much for having invited me to participate in this great conference. This is an extraordinary opportunity to learn together and to recall in that in this fight, this fight must be among all of us together, united. Now, here in Buenos Aires, I will meet other mayors for the next and upcoming lunch. And as you can imagine, my expectations of Argentine beef are really very high. At least some Argentines understand what I'm saying, right? Although I've heard that maybe now some of the best restaurants in Argentina are in Miami. And since I'm Cuban, not Argentine, I'm very simple, really. And I don't want to take any credit for the fact that the Pope, who's an Argentine, a Jesuit, when I went as a child, and that's why my name is Francis, so I'm not going to take all the credit for that either. But to me, it is a great honor being here with all of you. We really have a duty for our next generation. I have an eight-year-old child and a four-year-old girl and a daughter. So the world is like a school that they must enjoy, but not only them, but their children and grandchildren. We have to think about other generations, not just a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor Suarez, for your important remarks. This morning's. 
We heard today how cities are implementing their climate action plans in inclusive and impactful ways, ensuring that people have good green jobs and their health and well-being are a priority. Most importantly, we saw firsthand that collaboration with community leaders, civil society, business and youth is essential to accelerating the actions and ensuring the cities can help achieve climate justice. Before we wrap up our morning program, I'd like to take a moment to convey some key information for the rest of the day. And this is very important. A buffet-style vegan and vegetarian lunch will be served at the lobby and at the Sala Cortadera after this session and until 2 p.m. And we will come back together again in this room at 2 p.m. for our afternoon session. We will feature in-depth looks at green and thriving neighborhoods, sustainable transportation, and green energy transition. So, que tengan un delicioso almuerzo y nos vemos a las 2 de la tarde. Have a wonderful lunch and we'll resume at 2 p.m. Thank you.